The Care and Feeding of Humans, Book 1, written by Not Michael's Mom, taken from the HFY subreddit with the permission of the author. I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please don't forget to do the usual YouTube stuff. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Mezic, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. The Care and Feeding of Humans, Part 1, written by Really Not Michael's Mom. There are a number of expeditions that our class is dangerous enough to need humans on the team. This book is designed to walk you through caring and feeding humans so that when you arrive at your expedition, your humans will be happy and healthy enough to keep you safe. Die Book Review of the Ontological Species Studies The Care and Feeding of Humans Introduction Published by Glass and Steel The Care of Feeding of Humans Translation Engine 3.14159 Nerif scrolled through the catalog of available to hire. The long Zanadian tried to act as though she'd done this many times, while at the same time enjoying the bubbling of excitement that she'd felt inside. She was finally getting to work with the human. She'd been fascinated with them since she was a child, and had read everything that she could find about them. But this was her first time going on an expedition that required hiring not one, not two, but three humans. She marked her selection while watching her total change in the corner of the page. Higher skill set human costs more, obviously. She needed to balance the needs of her team with the budget she'd been given. She finally settled on two males with average skills, well, average for humans, and one female with a really excellent skill set. The only reason the expedition would be able to afford someone with her skills is that she was damaged. The catalog didn't go into details about the damage, only indicating the loss of the right arm and some personality damage from previous assignments. Nerif shivered in secret delight. Truth be told, the opportunity to work with the damaged human was even beyond her dreams, that she could explain to the team about the value she'd gotten and not have to reveal how the spell into her own plans made it perfect. She sent the requests along with the funds and the ship birth designation and then headed back to the report. She held herself with her long fingers wrapping around her waist. She felt like she might explode with excitement and held herself together in case her imagination became a reality. She was a highly imaginative being and liked to imagine that her thoughts could make things so. The next morning, she stepped into the hold holding her morning stimulant. She didn't need it this morning, but sipped anyway, trying to look as though this morning were no different than any other run. The two human males showed up first, and a ref could feel any chance of playing it cool just slipping away. Hi, I'm Nareth. You must be the two of our new humans. She could feel the feathers on her head raising in excitement and hoped the humans didn't know as much about her as she did about them. The two humans smiled and nodded in agreement. Smiled! She got to see them smile. If it hadn't been so undignified in being of her age and status, Nareth would have made a squee sound the very young Lemniads made. Well, the humans did pull their lips back and expose their teeth. She noticed the skin around their eyes didn't wrinkle. So, it wasn't a true smile. Just a polite gesture. Her hair dropped a little with disappointment. But she reminded herself that this was only the first meeting. Not a true meeting. The humans didn't seem to be armed, which was also a disappointment after hearing so many stories about how they loved their weapons. But Nareth mocked herself and pointed out that they could hardly be expected to walk around with their guns waving in the air. I'm Alan, and this handsome guy here is Nate, one of the humans said. Alan's coloration was unusual for humans, according to Nareth's research. He was so pale that she suddenly understood why humans labeled the skin color as white. His hair was a color that she couldn't quite place but didn't qualify as red unless humans had more color defects in their eyesight than her research had taught her. 
Nate's skin was also called white by humans, though much darker than Alan's skin color. She began to lean towards the color deficit theory. His hair was more common brown, the color of a kiwi bird's wings after a molt. She held out her hands in excitement, finally a chance to participate in a human greeting ritual, and said, Pleased to meet you. Alan shook her hand as she had expected, but Nate took a little longer and switched his bag from his left hand to his right so that he could shake her with the left hand. Alan and Nate exchanged discreet glances and small smiles that didn't actually reach their eyes, and Nareth was delighted that the greeting had attained true greeting status. After shaking their hands exactly two and a half times, she released their grip and said, We have one more human that should be arriving. After you have a chance to unpack your goods in your quarters, the entire ship will be meeting for a final briefing in the common area. Oh, Alan raised an eyebrow at her, and Nara found herself fascinated over the facial muscle control that allowed him to do that. She dug through her memory of the human facial trivia and remembered an uplifted eyebrow could mean curiosity, doubt, and sometimes humor. Who else is joining the team? A female human named Zoe. Um, do you know her? Nerev said. Alan shook his head. Never heard of her before. You're both human, Nerev said. Not quite a protest. Us and a few billion other people, Nate cut in. He swung his bag over his shoulder. Not all of your people know each other, do you? Nerev hesitated, not sure how to reply. She could name any of the people in sight, but didn't mean that she had met even a small percentage of them and it was rude to name people before you heard a true greeting. She wondered if never heard of her was a human expression about not having had a true greeting yet. Ah, of course, she said. Now, could you show us to our bunks? Nate asked. Bunks? Nareth repeated with the odd word. Her people prided themselves on their linguistic skills, and it hadn't occurred to her that she might need a translator. Her feathers flattened in embarrassment. He means our quarters. Nobody calls them bunks anymore except space cowboys, Alan put in. Space cowboys? Nareth repeated, a little hesitantly. Cowboys are an archaic job of guarding cows from thieves and predators, like Dire Wolf. Why would there be cowboys in space? Cows and their predators can't live there. Exactly, Alan said, as though she had proved the point he'd been making. But, um, Dire Wolves... They died out a few thousand years before cowboys started working. But I had read it in a novel, The Old Man and the Call of the Wild, about the author's battle of dire wolves in the plains and mountains of uh, Canada, she protested. Oh, Canada. Alan and Nate exchanged those small smiles again. Wasn't thinking about Canada. Nera felt a moment of relief that her research hadn't let her down, and her feathers responded with a small lift. She turned and gestured one of the droids over. If you'll please give this unit your bags, it'll take you to your quarters, your bunks. She added the new term carefully. She waved goodbye to Alan and Nate as they left the cargo hold. An energetic gesture that involved wrapping your hands back and forth, according to videos that she had researched. Seems like a good kid, Nate said as they walked away. And she loves her some human pulp fiction, Alan agreed. End of chapter. Part 2. Hiring Humans Humans do not thrive in solitary conditions. They are pack animals and need a pack around them. It is therefore recommended that you hire humans in group of three or more. When reproducing, they need both sets of their binary reproduction system, but their sex does not play into the makeup of the work group dynamic. Unlike the trolls, for example, where the group needs to be a matched set of nine, three mating groups. An expedition group of humans can all be male or female, or any mix of those. While humans consider themselves to be sexually dimorphic, males are hairier and bigger than females. In actual practice, it is impossible for anyone, even humans themselves, to determine a sex of a given human by pure observation. Human sexual dimorphism is above 15% as a species, approaching 0.01% in an individual comparisons. In contrast, 
trolls are 97% sexually dimorphic, so that they are not even regarded as the same species when they were first encountered. Dybuk Review of the Ontological Species Studies The Care and Feeding of Humans Hiring Humans the Perfect Mix Published by The Glass and Steel The Care and Feeding of Humans Translation Engine 3.14159 Nareth waited in the hold for the damaged human female to show up. How would she shake hands if the human was missing a right arm? Nareth thought back to the handshake with Alan and Nate. She would just hold out both hands and let Zoe pick which one she wanted to shake. Time passed, and while Zoe was not in danger of being late, Nareth would certainly agree that her arrival was delayed. Maybe Zoe had stopped on the way to the ship to get a pet. All the literature agreed that humans needed companion animals. In fact, the book, The Care and Feeding of Humans, specifically said that if humans were not allowed to bring their own animals with them, they were quite likely to adopt something that they find on the expedition. Usually, this would be announced by the human ritual of saying, Look what followed me home. Can we keep him? This was appraised as a question, but the book had cited several expedition failures when the response had been no, and strongly suggested that the question was something humans call rhetorical, which meant no response was expected. She wondered with some trepidation if Zoe would pick a smaller but the more unpredictably lethal predator known as a cat, or would she pick a larger predator known as dog? or something else. Humans were notorious in the wide range of animals that they considered pets. Would she be expected to touch the predator? Nerif shivered. Just as her imagination started to really pick up steam about what kind and how many predators Zoe might bring aboard, a human stepped on the deck, a bag tracking along behind her. It was definitely a her. While the care and feeding of humans had said that the sexual dimorphism between humans was less than 15% across the species, Nerif had no problem seeing the differences that marked Zoe as female. Her coloration was also much darker than either Nate or Alan, but not related to sexual dimorphism. She was also very tall for a human, coming in at almost Nerif's shoulder. However, Nerif blinked. When she'd ordered Zoe from the catalog, it had definitely said that she was missing an arm. This human female had both arms. Had she already regrown her arm? Nerif, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry I'm a little late, she smiled. It didn't touch her eyes, which were so dark that they were almost black, and held out her right hand. Nerif blinked. You are not late for check-in but I'm afraid there may not be as much time for your tour of the ship before we take off. Nareth shook Zoe's hand. Your pardon, but, um, you've already regrown your arm. Zoe frowned a little. What? You are a valuable human with many valuable skills and a proven history to use those skills. Quite frankly, the only reason this expedition was able to afford three humans, one with your skill set, was because you were damaged and missing an arm, but... Nareth looked down and gestured at the two hands that she could see. Ah! Zoe paused a moment, her face showing nothing that Nareth could see as an expression. The care and feeding of humans had said that reading human facial expressions was a skill that would take many years, but that sometimes no visible expression meant the human had been emotionally wounded by the conversation. I'm sorry, Nera stated. I did not mean to offend. I'm not offended, Zoe cut her off with a gesture. No, I have not regrown my arm. This is a prosthetic, see? She slid back a sleeve of her jacket, and there was a silver arm cuff just below the elbow, encircling Zoe's arm. There's the joint, and at least made it look like jewelry, but it's still just a prosthetic. Amazing, Nara bent over the arm. I've read that humans have a long history of creating artificial limbs when your limbs are severed. Yeah, well, Zoe pushed the sleeve back down, ending Nerif's inspection. I guess we do have a long history of that. Your people don't, right? Nerif stepped back and shook her head, proud that she had this human gesture down. No, well, it might have been a valuable in some instances, 
If we lost a limb, we would not live long enough for a prosthetic to help us. Zoe's face went blank again, and Nerif hesitated, not sure how she had offended. True, Zoe said, and then straightened herself a little. Anyway, regrowing an arm is expensive, which is why I agreed to this expedition. Even after swearing, she stopped herself. Lips pressed together, and then she switched topics. If you could please have someone show me to my quarters. Of course, I'll take you there myself, Nareff said. No need. I assumed that you are busy before pre-flight, so he said. I am the liaison officer, Nareff said with some pride. It is my job and my pleasure to make sure that you three are very comfortable on this trip. If you'll follow me... Nerif turned and headed down the same corridor that the droid had earlier let Alan and Nate down. Zoe took two long steps to catch up and walk beside Nerif, her luggage obediently trundling along behind her. So, there are three of us. Nerif nodded proudly. I was able to argue for a budget big enough for three, so that you would not suffer from lack of human companionship on the trip or expedition. Peachy... So he muttered, who are the other two? They are male humans, Alan and Nate. They are already in their quarters, so you can meet them soon. Oh, and I have navigation bracelets for all three of you. Nerif paused in front of the door and pressed the button. She then gestured to Zoe. Come, let the door scan you. Once you are scanned, you'll have private access to your quarters, except in case of emergencies. Zoe nodded, not even a false smile on her face. It's not my first rodeo. Not my first rodeo? Oh, a cowboy expression, meaning you've done this many times before. Nate also used a cowboy expression today. Are space cowboys common? Nate and Alan are space cowboys, Zoe asked. Her voice sounded different, and Nareff hesitated again. Humans were a mix of scary strong, dangerous, and fragile and this very expensive human was already damaged. She didn't want to make things worse, so decided that honesty was the best thing that might help the most. I'm not sure, Nara said. She mentally reviewed the conversation that she'd had with the males. Alan seemed to think not, she added. Are space cowboys a bad thing? Zoe snorted, and Nara immediately decided that she would practice that sound in her quarters tonight perhaps in the rejuvenation area, where no one else would hear her until she got it right. Zoe seemed to relax after the snort and finish coding her room. When the door released, Zoe walked in and motioned her luggage to the corner near the bed. She looked around the room, not as nice as the hospital where she spent the last couple months, but much nicer than the crew quarters that she'd ever had before. The colors were in blues and greens with hints of purple that reminded her of Nerf's coloring. The textures were rich and inviting, from the bedside table that seemed carved from driftwood to the rich, nubbly blue throw that covered the bed. She looked up and noticed Nerf was watching her intently. If something's not to your liking, Nerf started to say, and so he waved her off and smiled. The smile, Nerf noticed, went all the way to Zoe's eyes. She had won her first smile from the female. Oh, um, this is great, Zoe said softly. Did you decorate it, or do all quarters look like this? Naris, normal night blue coloring shifted slightly to purple. Zoe was fascinated. It was like watching someone underwater with waves of soft color flowing over her. Well, Naris said, all the quarters have a bed in one kind or another and a table. But I read in a catalogue that you like to read and that your favourite colours are blues and greens, so, um, I, um, she trailed off. Zoe's eyes seemed wetter than normal. Nareff couldn't see actual water coming out of them, so Zoe wasn't crying, but Nareff mentally flailed around helplessly. The carrot feeding of humans had never mentioned wet eyes. Zoe turned away from Nareff abruptly and stripped off her jacket taking care to load it into the closet. When she turned back to Nareff, her eyes were no longer wet. Ah, Nareff thought, it was sweat. She was hot and took off her jacket, and now she is no longer sweating. You are familiar with how to adjust the climate controls of your quarters? Nareff asked when Zoe nodded. Nareff felt a flush of relief. 
While the temperature did not seem excessive hot to her, it was good to know that Zoe could adjust to match her needs. Oh, your navigation bracelet. Nareth put one slender hand in her pocket and pulled out the bracelet at a dial. I don't think anything is scheduled before departure. We will have a meeting in the common room for the last meal and briefing updates. Zoe nodded. Thank you. I'll give time to unpack, Nareth said. Unless you want the tour of the ship now. No, 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 thank you. Zoe added the last part as almost an afterthought. Maybe later? Nareth nodded gravely. Until later then. She left Zoe's room and once the door closed behind her, tapped her own navigation bracelet for the quarters of Alan and Nate. She'd been so excited to perform the handshakes that she'd forgotten to give them their bracelets. End of chapter. Part 3 Make sure your humans have bonded to you before you embark on your expedition. Fortunately, humans bond easily and just being near them will cause them to bond with you. There are some that say that humans require gifts to bond, but we would refer you to the history of the expedition Slush and what happened when the humans were given gifts. It's best just to make sure that they have fresh food and water and plenty of exercise and that they can access you whenever they need to. Dear book, Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Garrett Feeding of Humans, Human Bonding, published by Glass and Steel. The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. Nerif headed to the common room early, determined to secure the prime seating for herself and the three humans. When she arrived, the three were already there, eating some fruit and cutting it up with knives. They looked like, uh... Nareth shivered with guilty excitement remembering the stories that she'd read, but they looked like pirates. Ah, here's our patron now, Nate said as Nareth stepped through the opening. Nareth walked up to their table and sat down. So, uh, what's the scuttlebutt about this expedition? Nate asked. And as well, right, that's why you hired three humans. You want the meanest, toughest, baddest creatures at your back to help you investigate a death world. Zoe, roll her eyes. Stop a sock in it, Nate, she said. You start spinning tales about humans and how they're filled with acid and can read people's minds or track you in the dark through sound alone. And you're going to regret it when they drop you on a planet with no backup. Nerif coughed. According to the Karen feeding of humans, the sound could indicate either a potentially life-threatening problem or a desire to speak. When the humans turned their face to her, she realized that she'd gotten the sound level right. Nate is at least partially correct. This is a death world. We are here as the second expeditionary force. The first one did only a scan from high orbit. The initial scan rate said it a two or a three on the death world scale. Alan snorted. Three? That's nothing. Earth rates like a ten. Heck, Australia alone is an eight. Hawaii is a three, and that's a garden paradise. Nerif nodded, her feathers flat and solemn. We hope you are correct, Alan. However, even humans die in Hawaii, and we are less likely to survive a three without you to help us. The leader expedition will be here soon, Nerif continued. They will explain the details of the mission and how the first flyby was able to classify it as a Class 3. At that, Zoe grabbed more food, a complex cooked solid grain product, and tucked it in her leg pocket. As soon as they saw what Zoe was doing, Nate and Alan started hiding food too. Narab's feathers rose with excitement. She'd heard of the phrase squirreling food away and even seen a video of a squirrel an earth rodent with a fluffy tail and a lot of nervous energy, stuffing food into its cheeks. But she didn't really get the phrase until now. Admittedly, her earth friends were not stuffing the food into their mouths, but the actions of stuffing the food into various pockets reminded her strongly of the video of the squirrel. You say, they, Zoe said, while tucking an unopened can into a bag that she had slung around her hips. The expedition is, um, Cree? Nerif nodded. Yes. Wait, Alan said. 
How did you know that? Zoe nodded at Nerev. She said they would come and tell us the details. I don't know all the races in the aggregate, but I know at least one that uses the plural pronoun for individuals. The Cree. Nate shook his head and poked Alan in the side. Pay up, partner, he said, and pulled a couple coins out of his pocket and slapped them on the table in front of Zoe. Alan slid his across the table like a small skater bugs. Nerev watched with interest as Zoe scooped up the coins and dropped them into a bag. Pleasure doing business with you boys, she said, and swung her long legs out from under the table so that her back was against the table, just as the expedition leader and the other members of the expedition walked in. Nerev stared, her feathers puffing up and then immediately back down, but she saw the humans hadn't been surprised at all. How did you know? Nerev said quietly. Humans have really good hearing, Nate said, just as quietly. We can hear them walking down the hall. As the liaison officer, it was Nerev's responsibility to introduce all members of the team to each other. Species were never mentioned, but she introduced each person with the special skills that they brought to the team. The team, as usual, will consist of one hand on the ground and one hand on the ship. As Nareth introduced the hand that would stay on the ship, Zoe, Alan, and Nate, in that order, realized that it was pretty much everyone. The biologist, the climatologist, geologist, virologist, and two other ists were all staying on the ship. On the way, team, there were two droids and... Alan is our first bodyguard. His special skill is being human. Nate is our second bodyguard. His special skill is being human. Zoe is our third bodyguard. Her special skill is being human and having survived four Death World explorations. Nareth announced this last triumphantly. Being able to hire three humans, one with Zoe's skill set, was quite a coup. And she wanted to share the details of the transaction with the rest of the team. She left out the parts about Zoe's damage because that made the deal seem uh, not bad exactly, but... Less impressive. Zoe coughed. It seems our hand is a little short. Six are staying on board and three are going down to the surface. Oh no, Nara said earnestly. There are six of us. You three, me and my two nesters. Oh, hello, Zoe said. You and your nesters are staying on board with everyone else. Give us an extra droid and we'll call it six on the away team. But Zoe, Nara protested. We must go. I am the liaison officer, and as head of my nest, my nestus must come with me. Besides, Quarif is our shuttle pilot, and Tariff is our chief. Zoe stood up and stormed from the room. If the doors of the ship could have been slammed shut, Tariff was pretty sure that Zoe would have slammed them behind her. As it was, the door closed with a gentle hiss. Nate stood up. Don't worry about her temper, he said. You know us humans, we get angry, it blows over, she'll be fine by the time we land. Alan stood up too. Yeah, uh, what he said, and we should um, uh, probably follow her and, and talk to her. Alan pulled at Nate's sleeve. See, see you tomorrow for breakfast. The two males followed Zoe out of the door as quickly as she had left, but not nearly the amount of anger that she had projected. Nerif? the captain said. Have you offended our humans? No, Nareth said, worry making her feathers flat top and fluff out around her shoulders. I, I, I don't think so. I only showed them to their rooms. That was all. Nareth thought about Zoe's strange reaction when Nareth had shown off the bedroom. Surely Zoe hadn't been offended by that. Nareth had asked, well, that first human, which one was it? They all look alike, do we? said the captain. No, sir, Nareth objected. They are very different. Alan is the palest and Zoe is the darkest, and Nate is right in the middle. But what if there is only two of them, or one? How do you know which one it is? Tiv asked, Tiv being a biologist, so the question was probably just academic. Well, um, Zoe is female. She's also the tallest. She's very tall for a human and comes up to almost my shoulder, Nareth explained. 
Discuss this later, the captain interrupted. Right now, you have to fix this. We need these humans to be bonded to us before we make landfall. We're already stretching out the trip to a new planet for two weeks to give them time to bond with us. If we need more time, we'll need more supplies. Go find out what the issue is and to fix it. You are the liaison officer. Arif bowed her head. Immediately, sir. She left the common area and touched a bracelet. Where is Zoe? The bracelet responded, and there followed the blue light that appeared before her. End of chapter. Part 4. Humor, the best weapon. As with any death world species, humans are quick to anger. Loss of personal property seems to be a high on the list of possible triggers, of which there are too many to list. For more detail, please see Expedition, Silence, and details about why the Glint are no longer allowed to hire humans. When faced with an angry human, it is best to speak in soft, soothing tones. Reminding them to relax or calm down can also be an extremely helpful. When all else fails, make a human laugh. For this reason, we suggest that you learn a set of jokes, or keep a stash of funny videos on hand at all times. Remember, just because it's funny to you, doesn't mean it's funny to humans. Please check with the human first to see if the humor is funny to all humans. WIAC Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Humor, the Best Weapon. Published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. Zoe was facing off against Alan and Nate, and Nerif wondered if there might be bloodshed and if the infirmary was stocked for human-on-human -human damage. Do you have any effing clue what's going on? Your big skill addition is being human. Zoe made angry claw gestures in the air when she said that, being human, and Nerif moved her hand closer to the emergency call button. Exactly how many effing missions have you been on? As many as one, Zoe continued in an angry voice. Um... Nate interrupted Zoe with a motion of his hand towards Nareth. Zoe turned and saw Nareth standing behind her and took a deep breath. Zoe, Nareth said, and was surprised at how small her voice sounded. She took a deep breath and tried again. Zoe, what happened? You are so angry and you didn't stay for the briefing. We only did the introductions, Nareth said, and this time her voice sounded better, calm and reassuring just like the book said. Zoe suddenly stood up straight, her face still with only her hands moving open and closed, open and closed. You're absolutely right. I apologize. Zoe headed back to the common room with Alan and Nate trading behind her. Nate paused in front of Nareth. Good job, kiddo, he said, before quickening his pace to catch up with the other two humans. Nareth hurried after them and stopped in the door as Zoe approached the captain. Nareth could see the captain's hand move casually towards his alarm button as Zoe approached. But he stopped when Zoe stopped a meter away from him. Captain, Zoe said, and bowed in a short and hard. I apologize for my behavior and for interrupting the briefing. It will not have it again. The captain waved his hand. Allowances are made for certain skills as long as you have not been made unhappy by any member of the crew or expedition. Zoe swallowed. No... My unhappiness is my own and not the responsibility of any other beings. The captain nodded gravely. Well said, he turned back to Nareth. If you are finished with the introductions, perhaps we can continue with the briefing. Nareth nodded. My nesters are in the rejuvenation part, but will be able to attend breakfast tomorrow. I will introduce them to the human team tomorrow. Nareth was sure that she saw muscle spasm in Zoe's cheek. But human faces moved so much, it was hard to tell if that meant anything. Zoe, Alan, and Nate took their recently vacated seats, and Nareth sat back down next to Zoe. Even though Zoe's anger had been a scary and impressive, Nareth wanted to make sure that everyone knew that she felt safe enough with Zoe to sit next to her. The captain made a gesture, and the lights dimmed, and an image of the planet appeared before the audience. This original survey mission was just a flyby, and it is given a rating of two or three. 
and that is really just more of a precaution. The image zoomed in, and Narif could see the planet was just a jungle planet, lush and green, with a few small seas scattered about. The flyby was able to drop off a ground station with no issue, and there have been no reports of any storms or violent geological disturbances. The hand of the ground will be charged with collecting data from the station, isn't able to collect, and placing new backup batteries for the station power. Standard sample collections. We're really not expecting anything big or bad. However, that's when something big and bad with lots of teeth tends to bite you in the tail. His tail twitched as if trying to avoid that bite. The image zoomed in again, and the ground station was now visible in the jungle. A small clearing around it, where the false field kept away any nasty surprises. The image tilted slightly, and Nerev could now see the long stretch of gentle shoreline. When the survey team dropped off to the ground station, they missed their target spot, which was supposed to be the near ground on the landing site here. The image moved and tilted, and Nerev could now see the landing site and the ground station. She swallowed. It looked like a lot of jungle in between. The shuttle would drop the ground team here. A red dot appeared on the shoreline of the map. They will then have to hike to the ground station. It means a 30-click walk through the jungle of an unexplored world. Not ideal. Not what anyone wanted, but we took it on contract. Narev glanced at Zoe, while trying not to look at her directly. Humans were notorious for finding ways out of contracts. The fact that she had fulfilled four contracts already spoke well of her, though. Would Zoe realize how important the contract was to the expedition team? Zoe spoke up. We may need one extra droid to take her with us. Is that possible? We may need extra supplies in case of unexpected delays. Of course, the captain said. It wouldn't be a good business to endanger the mission over something as small as not enough supplies. Take two more droids. The lights came back on and Nareth noticed everyone was watching Zoe. Even Alan and Nate seemed to be focused on her. Even though Nate had made a show of pulling some food out of his pocket and taking a bite of it. Sounds like a piece of cake, he said. Nara saw the puzzled faces of some of the expedition. He means that it sounds simple, she clarified to them, and was rewarded with a smile from Nate. Yes, very simple, Zoe agreed. And at that, everyone seemed to breathe a sigh of relief and started to leave. Not hurried, exactly, but not dawdling either as they left the room. Though they did seem to give the humans a wide berth, leaving Zoe, Alan, Nate and Nareff alone at the table. So, uh, Nareff said, I guess right about now you want to know where the gym is. End of chapter. Part 5 Maxercise is the first step. Allow your humans time to move. Humans that aren't bored or not physically active do not do well on a ship and will start inventing games to distract themselves. Since many human games are dangerous, if not downright lethal, make sure they have plenty of time and space for safe, supervised exercise. See day three logs of the expedition silence for the kinds of games that humans will start playing when not sufficiently stimulated. A treadmill is often considered a good investment for any ship, but not the standard medical rehabilitation one. Our advice is to get the industrial grade treadmill used as punishment in prisons. Humans can run for many kilometers. It is not uncommon for them to run two to three kilometers a day. And most will run many more than that. Dubuque, Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Exercise is the First Step. Published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. Zoe laughed a little and her body seemed to relax. A gem would be good. If you are still angry, I have a joke. The book says that jokes help humans not be angry anymore, Nareth said. What book would this be? Zoe asked, her eyes narrowing just a touch. The care and feeding of humans, Nareth said proudly. It is a classic in the field and very well researched. You'll have to let me read it sometime, Zoe said. Nate said, wait, um, I want to hear the joke. Are you angry, Nate? Nareth asked. No, but a good joke is always welcome, Nate said. Nareth stood straight as though about to lecture an audience. 
A domestic end today walks into a bar... A, a what? Alan asked. She means a duck, Zoe said as an aside. Nero corrected herself. A duck walks into a bar and asks for ten beers. He drinks one after the other and then starts to leave the bar. The beer tender, bartender, Alan interrupted. The bartender says, Oi, duck, you have to pay for those beers. The duck turns to him and says, Nero paused for the punchline. Put it on my tab. Nero smiled and paused, waiting for the reaction. First, Nate started to chuckle. Then Zoe started to laugh. Then Alan started laughing so hard that Nara feared he was in danger of injuring himself. Pretty soon the three humans were laughing and leaning against each other, wiping tears out of their eyes. Why are you crying? Was it that funny? Nara funny, Alan said between bursts of lava. It was perfect because uh, I'd cried is a compliment. Wow. Nareth observed the weakened state of the humans, still chuckling while Nate kept repeating, <laughs> Humor really is the best weapon. Once the three humans seemed capable of walking again, Nareth asked, Do you still want to see the gym? Yes, Nate said. We're gonna keep our human muscles good and strong. Zoe rolled her eyes, but smiled, and Nareth touched her bracelet and said, The gym, and started following the blue light. Zoe had a side. Zoe paused and turned to look at Alan and Nate. Come on, guys. Uh, follow the will-o'-wisp. Nara frowned just a little. Why do humans call it that? It's just a guide. Nate jumped in. A will-o'-wisp is a ghost light. It actually has a bunch of names and different spellings, but basically, it lures people that are lost into dangerous situations, usually quicksand. Nara shot a quick look at Zoe. Zoe didn't seem to disagree with what Nate was saying, but Nara couldn't believe what she'd heard. I'm sorry, ghost light. And what is quicksand? Nate spoke again before Alan and Zoe could contradict him. Quicksand is an amazing non-Newtonian fluid. It's a solid until you touch it. Once you step in it, it becomes a liquid and will suck you in and drown you. The harder you try and swim, the faster you sink in. Lemniads are excellent swimmers, Nerf said, spreading her fingers wide to show the webbing between her fingers. We don't drown. We certainly don't drown in sand. Nate likes a good spin on a good tail, Alan said. I do not, Nate interrupted. But in this case, Alan said, while pointedly looking at Nate, he happens to be sort of correct. Being a good swimmer might work against you. Best to hold still and let us rescue you. While the humans had been telling scary stories designed to scare nymphs, the four of them had been walking and following the blue light. It led them to a door that opened as they approached. Nerev stepped through, but Zoe, Nate, and Alan stopped in the doorway. Wow, Zoe said. Nerev smiled. Do you like it? We tried to get every physical activity we could. We have a machine where you can run and run and not go anywhere. We have a fake rock wall to climb. We have a stick that will be as heavy as you want if you want to lift it. We have the machine that'll let you pretend to be on water and move a fake boat or surf. We have a fake water where you can swim, but use the goggles. They will help. Nara pointed to a selection of lightweight goggles hanging on the wall. Cool, Alan exclaimed, grabbing a pair of goggles and slipping them over his head. He waved his hand in front of his face and then headed towards the surfboard. Holy hot dog, Alan shouted. This is awesome! He waggled back and forth on the board, moving forward and back, trying to find a sweet spot on the mechanical board with no waves. The goggles make it look like I'm surfing in Hawaii. Nate grabbed the next set of goggles and headed towards the rock wall. Whoa, he said, in a much more awed tone than Alan. El Capitan! As he stared up at the wall, the texture of the rocks changed and he continued to climb the wall and seemed to roll, like a vertical treadmill so that he never climbed higher than three feet off the ground. They aren't very many goggles, so he motioned as she grabbed a pair from the wall as well. Nero shrugged. Probably you are the only people that'll be using the gym. My book says that you need a lot of outlets for energy, but most people don't enjoy doing work for no reason. Well, uh, Nate said, hanging from the wall, we kind of have to. As humans, our muscles require a lot of stimulation in order to help keep our bones strong especially in lower gravity that you favor. Plus, exercise helps keep our acid in our bodies where it belongs, instead of spinning out at night. Nero looked at Nate, horrified. 
Your acid spills out at night. Alan, still trying to master the surfboard, said, Hardly ever. Zoe rolled her eyes again. You guys make it sound like we're just giant bags of acid, waiting to leak out on someone. Oh, we are kind of, Alan pointed out. Zoe turned to Nerev. We do have acid in us, but it's to help break down food into something our bodies can use. We're omnivores, so our digestive juices have to be able to handle all kinds of foods. Not just food, it said as he climbed up another ledge. Humans can eat metal, stones, glass, an airplane. Nerev's eyes grew round and worried. We don't have any of those items on the menu. Good, Zoe said firmly, giving Nate a look. He was totally oblivious to her anger since he was wearing goggles to climb Al Capitan and was facing away from her. His fingers slipped anyway and he dangled by one arm until he was able to get another purchase with his hands. We really don't eat that stuff for food. Only some humans do it and it's called pika. If you meet a human that brags about eating rocks or metal, back away slowly. Come on, Zoe, Nate said. He pulled himself up into another ledge. You're taking all the fun out of being human. End of chapter. Part 6 While renowned for the strength, stamina, and survival rule of three, footnote one, humans can also be emotionally fragile. They take their bonds very seriously. Once you have bonded with a human, you must take that bond seriously as well. Any attempt to betray that bond can result in serious consequences. Please see the history of the Clint and why they are not allowed to employ humans anymore. But not one. An average human can survive for three minutes without air or in icy water. They can survive for three hours in the extreme environment, the Arctic and the Sahara wiki entries for Earth. They can survive for three days without water if they have shelter. They can survive three weeks without food if they have water. Dibiak, Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, With Great Bonding Comes Great Responsibility. Published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. Nerev hung around the humans while they worked out. The book had been very clear that humans needed supervision during their workouts, and she took a job very seriously. The fact that she got to watch them work out was purely a sight benefit. Alan was nothing if not dedicated. He spent all of his time on the surfboard and didn't seem to be dismayed at all when it would periodically dump him on the floor. He would yell, wipe out, and climbed back on. After the third or fourth time, he laughed maniacally before yelling, wipe out, and then proceeded to make strange noises. Nareth wondered if he had suffered a debilitating brain injury after his fall, but neither Zoe nor Nate seemed to be perturbed by his noises. In fact, Nate joined in. Soon, Nareth realized that it was a song that had Alan and Nate were singing. Human songs were nothing like the songs of her people, and while she respected the restraint and tradition of her songs, something about the wild way that Nate and Alan were singing called to her. She wondered to join in, but wasn't sure she had the rhythm right. Zoe, she noticed, didn't join in on the song. Maybe it was a song that only men sang. Nareth doubted since the book hadn't said anything about that, and so he seemed. While Nate and Alan were definitely enjoying themselves, Zoe had hopped up on the treadmill, pulled the goggles down over her eyes, and started running, an even, steady pace, when at a speed that made Nareth think uncomfortably about human history of Apex Pursuit Predator. She wondered what scene set the plane for Zoe's goggles, Zoe seemed to be running as if she wanted to run to the end of the scene set. There was no light-heartedness. She didn't share with what she was seeing. She just ran. She ran until her body was covered in water. She ran until she was gasping for breath. And she kept on running. The pure intensity, the fierceness of it, made Nareth take a hesitant step back. Finally, she looked away and watched Nate. He'd given up on climbing Al Capitan, whatever that was. Nero promised herself to look it up later. He'd moved on to rowing the fake boat and was singing songs. Nero remembered the stories that she'd read about pirates and wondered if they were pirate songs. She made another mental note to ask him about the songs at breakfast. 
At no point did one of the humans say, hold my beer. This phrase the book had warned her meant that the human involved was about to do something incredibly stupid and dangerous, even by human standards. All in all, she didn't really feel like they had needed her supervision. Once the humans were done exercising, they headed back to their quarters. Nerif wished them a good night and was pleased to see that all used the guide lights to get back to their quarters. She headed back to her own quarters and didn't realize until the door was closed behind her just how tense she had been. She slipped off her uniform and joined Querif and Tariff in the rejuvenation pond. So, Querif asked, where are the humans all you were hoping for? So much more, Nerif said as she settled back into the vibrating water. The pulses of energy in the water danced over her skin like tinkling bubbles. And she sighed and closed her eyes, her feathers fluffing out in peaceful puff. After a minute, she opened her eyes and examined her nesters with a critical gaze. You are going to have to meet them at breakfast tomorrow, she said. I think your feathers are grown in enough that you don't need to spend all your time in the rejuvenation part anymore. Thus, you need bonding time with them. We need to be sure that they've bonded to us before we make landfall. Tara put on one hand on his head and smoothed down his feathers. In all honesty, they still looked a little short and stiff. Post malt. Do, um, do you really think that we're ready? Tariff asked. I mean, my bloomage is totally ready, but Querif, I'm not sure he's ready to go out in public yet. Querif responded by splashing water at Tariff. Tariff splashed back with a bigger wave that sloshed water out over the pod and ran down the drain and stalled into the quarters of every Lindmead. Nerif smiled. Her nesters could be a handful, but they were good boys, and she was glad that all their mothers had agreed to share a nest. After they were done splashing, Tariff turned back to Nerif. Will we be able to tell which one is the damaged one at breakfast tomorrow? Nerif closed her eyes again and smiled. You tell me after breakfast. End of chapter. Part 7. Breakfast, the most important meal of the day. Humans have a saying, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. When originally researched, it seemed like this saying was a direct result of propaganda on the part of the breakfast food manufacturers. However, direct observation tells us that this is a time when humans reconnect with their others and with other objects, animals, or people that have been bonded with. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, because that's when humans do much of their bonding. Eat breakfast with your humans whenever possible. Dubuque, review of ontological species studies, the Garen feeding of humans, breakfast the most important meal of the day. Published by Glass and Steel, the Garen feeding of humans, translation engine 3.14159. Before leaving their quarters in the morning, Nerif insisted on running her hands over Querif and Tariff's head, making sure that all the feathers were in place. She wanted everyone looking their best for their first breakfast. Querif and Tariff put up their fussing, picking up on her tension. You both read the book, right? Tariff said. You know how to act and what not to say. Tariff nodded. I, 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 I'm talking about food, what they like, what they don't, and if they have any allergies. Good, Tariff said. Well, I plan to ask them if they are get air sick or, or, or like to do barrels, Querif said, a sly grin playing over his face. Nera rolled her eyes. She'd learned that trait from the book and thought that it was a perfect expression for how the boys acted sometimes. Not boys, she reminded herself. Querif saw her expression and laughed. Just kidding. Actually, Tara said, they might like barrels since they're human. You are not helping, Nera said. Now come on, we don't want to be late. By the time they got to the common room, Zoe, Nate, and Alan were already seated. The other members of the crew, Nara saw with satisfaction, were stopping by and greeting the humans, but leaving space at the table for the Lineards. Since they were the ones doing the landfall with the humans, it was right and proper that they had the most opportunity to bond with the humans. Good morning, Nara said. Zoe, Alan, and Nate, she pointed at each one and said their name. These are my nesters, Querif and Tariff. Pleased to meet you, Nate said, and as he stood up and reached his hand across the table. Tariff made a tiny, little squeak of joy. 
Nerev could totally relate to it, since she'd done as much of the same when she'd got to do her first handshake with the human. Hopefully, since the sound was so small enough that the humans hadn't heard it. None of them commented on it, although a hint of a smile crossed Alan's face. Well, she just hoped that it wouldn't mention it and embarrass Terra. After everyone had participated in a general handshaking, they all sat back down at the table. So, uh, Nate said, Nerif, Querif, and Terif. Is the fact that your names rhyme a coincidence, or does it mean ow? Nerif heard a loud thunk from under the table that coincided with Nate's exclamation. Damn it, Zoe! What do you kick me for? I'm just asking a question, Nate complained. I know where your questions are headed. You dirty-minded man, Zoe said. I wasn't going to ask anything improper, Nate protested. See that you don't, Zoe said, and turned her attention back to her food. Do you have to clean your mind? Quarif asked. Why is it dirty? Nerif put her hand on Quarif's shoulder and grinned at Nate. At least she doesn't kick like yours does. Alan smothered his laugh behind his napkin. Well, we're all from the same nest, Nerif explained, so our names share a similarity. Ah, Nate said. So, um, does it mean you all sleep to- Ow! He glared at Zoe and rubbed his leg under the table. Can you at least switch legs? He asked her. Of course we sleep together, Tariff said. We're nesters. Why wouldn't we? He gave Nate a puzzled look. This time, Zoe laughed at Nate. I told you to mind your questions, she said, and shook her head at him. He groaned and rubbed his leg again. So, um, Tariff. Zoe asked and studied the casualness, and she struck out a fork with the food. How old are you? Thirty-six rotations, he said proudly. Quareff and I just finished our malt. He smoothed down the feathers on his head stealth-consciously. And Nerif, um, you're 37 or 38 rotations, Zoe continued. 40 rotations, Nerif corrected. So, you're all adults, Mary, Zoe said. Hey, Quarif said, a mock injured tone. We're still young at heart. Zoe smiled, but Nerif saw that it didn't touch her eyes. She thought quickly. If you three don't have any plans this morning, Nerif said, I thought the six of us could do a tour of the ship. Querif can show off his fancy shuttle, and Tariff can quiz you about human foods and why you would willingly eat toxic chemicals. Oh, that's a new one, Nate said. Toxic chemicals. I'll make note of that. Usually people ask about capsaicin. What toxic chemicals do we eat? Tariff nodded. I've heard that you eat these things called uh, hot dogs, which are made out of leftover bits of... Um... Nate interrupted him. Hold up a hand. Right, st stop there, buddy. Uh, I like hot dogs too much to know what they're made of. Nara glanced at Zoe, whose shoulders were slightly slumped. Now, the book said that could mean that she was tired or relaxed. Nara remembered the workout at the gym last night and was going to put a bet on tired when Zoe looked up and caught Nara watching. Zoe straightened. A tour would be great, thank you. Would you mind coming to find me after you're all done with breakfast? Zoe shoved her empty plate towards the middle of the table and threw her napkin on top. The takeaway at the center of the table disposed of the dirty dishes, and Zoe stood up and tugged at the bottom of her vest. See you in a few, or a little longer, if you let Alan eat his full. Zoe headed towards the door, swiping a piece of fruit off the table on her way out. It did take longer than Nareth had expected for Alan to finish his breakfast. The roofs were all finished before he was... And even when he was still done, he grabbed a package of crackers and tucked them in a pocket. Why do you do that? Nareff asked. Do what? Alan asked, as he tucked the second packet away with the first. Hide food in your clothes. Nareff pointed at Alan's hand, and he looked down in surprise and then laughed. Habit, I guess, he said. You have a habit of putting food in your clothes. Then why do Zoe and Nate do it too? Nareff asked. Well, you have to understand one thing about humans, Nate interjected into the conversation as they reached over and grabbed an apple and stuffed it into a pocket. We can live a long time without food, he said. Tariff nodded. The book says you can live without food for three weeks. Trust Tariff to remember the food-related details. Three weeks, Nate scoffed. We can live longer than that if the conditions are right. But why I knew this one fella, he had jaws wide shut and lived on drinks alone for well, a good long time. Anyways, we can live a long time without food, but we really don't like it, so we hoard food. Do, uh, 
Aren't humans a hard food? Tara asked. The book hadn't said anything about that trait. Not all humans, no, Nate said. The easygoing smile left his face. Just any of them that ever worked for the glint. Oh, Querif said. The uncomfortable twitch of his feathers. Silence took the place of conversation and banter between them. And then Nate brightened and put a smile back on his face. Hey, uh, how about that tour? He asked. End of chapter. Part 8 There is a large amount of evidence that, while humans grow old, they never grow up. Even in human societies, there are wide discrepancies about adulthood. Ages for drinking or inhaling intoxicants, fighting wars, driving manual drive vehicles, procreating, and even voting in elections are non-standard on the entire Earth world. Combine that with the common complaint amongst themselves that they don't know how to adult, as well as their propensity for dangerous entertainment, and many psychologists agree that humans never actually become adults. Abyuk, Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, There's Snow on the Roof, published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. The tour went quite well, Nerith thought. Quereth got to show off the shuttle, which was his pride and joy. Tariff got time to quiz each person about their favorite and not-so-favorite foods. Even Zoe answered his questions politely. And if Tariff was a little disturbed by some of their menu choices, he didn't show it. Of course, Linmeads were far from vegetarians themselves. When it came to food sources in the aggregate, the simple rule was sapient races don't eat other sapient races. And that was generally good enough for everyone. Nerif watched Zoe carefully, and Zoe did seem to be enjoying herself. She seemed relaxed and would laugh at stories, or just watch Quirif being so excited about his shuttle. And then, uh, something would happen, and Zoe would become stiff and distant. The first time it happened, Quirif had been giving the tour of the shuttle. Everything was fine, and then Zoe accidentally banged her arm on the doorway. It made a loud clang, but Quirif barely stopped talking, so Nareth wasn't sure what had made Zoe clamp down again. The second time it happened, Tariff had just asked Zoe what her favorite sauce was. Zoe had reached out with her left hand to scratch her right arm. As soon as she started, she stopped and froze. Tariff had to ask her a second time. When it happened a third time, just after Zoe had been stretching her arms over her head, Nareth finally got it. Zoe was fine until something reminded her of a prosthetic arm. Nerys thought back to her questions of Zoe yesterday and cringed inwardly. She'd seen Zoe's face go blank and just hadn't put it all together. At least some of Zoe's emotional damage was related to her arm. When Nerys had ordered Zoe from the catalog, there hadn't been a lot of details available. Sometimes entire records about the expedition were sealed so Nareth hadn't really thought about what Zoe's past jobs had been. She'd just been excited to be able to hire a human with Zoe's skills at such a great price. Well, that and getting to be around humans. Sealed records, Nareth thought. Certainly she couldn't access those records, but Nareth knew a guy, and he might have access to those records. Once the tour was over, Zoe, Alan, and Nate headed to the records room to study the details of the flyby. Quereff and Terra both had jobs to get to, but they lingered for a minute after the humans took off. It's Nate, isn't it? said Terra. Quereff nodded in agreement. Nate is the damaged one. Nareth looked at them both in surprise. Why do you say that it's Nate? Quereff shrugged. He's always joking around, but doesn't actually laugh a lot. If we're a funny guy, he doesn't seem that happy. It seems like a cover, Terra added. And why would they need a cover unless they were damaged or trying to hide it? Nero looked down the corridor that the humans had taken to the records room. I hadn't thought of that. See you in the common room for dinner. Don't be late. Terra rolled his eyes, evidently a habit he picked up from her. Nero, you're not our mother, and we're perfectly capable adults. Well, I am. Quereth might not be. Whatever else he might have wanted to say got lost as Quereth gave Tariff a shove and then grabbed him around the neck. Try using your words, Quereth, Tariff said in a slightly strangled voice. A physical response shows a lack of wit. 
Nera walked away, knowing this could go on for a good ten minutes. She hurried down the corridor after the humans, the guide light taking her to the records room. Nera found Zoe, Nate, and Alan gathered around the hollow of the planet, created during the flyby. No satellites like our moon, Nate said. That means no big tides to speak of. Alan nodded in agreement. And look at this, here, here, and here. He spun the planet around and pointed at the three large areas of water. The records indicate salt water, but they're not oceans, really. They're just seas, so I'm guessing no hurricanes. I agree, said Zoe. Of course, that doesn't rule out tornadoes or other extreme wind conditions. No huge mountains, Zoe paused and thought. Might indicate no tectonics, but could be harsh storms that scour everything flat. No volcanoes, Nate said, giving the planet another spin. Nerif realized that they were assessing the planet versus their own planet dangers. It was odd hearing them discuss the very things that made their own world so dangerous in such casual terms. We should check for evidence of storms, especially electrical storms, Zoe said. Nate shook his head. The ground station hasn't reported any storms in the nine months that it's been here. What about the state of the trees near the landing spot? Alan asked. Then they look a little weird to you. He spread out his hand, zooming in on the image. Hmm. Zoe turned her head sideways. See what you mean. I don't see damage, but I do see new growth. No bones, not a lot of litter on the floor. But something is weird. She looked at Nate. What do you think? Nate looked and shrugged. No records of storms in the past nine months. New growth, but no marks of debris. Maybe it was spring? Zoe nodded slowly. It's possible. But I think we should prepare for storms, just in case. Alan, will you confirm that there are enough storm tents for us and the droids? No problem. Alan made some notes in his combat. Does anyone know when we get close enough to get live update images? Zoe asked. Nate and Alan looked at each other and shook their heads. Nerev coughed, and they looked at her in surprise. Evidently, no one had noticed her come in into the room. I believe that we will have updated images one week out. Quareth was demanding updates for his flight plans, she said. Good, Nate said. Zoe turned back to the planet, as though looking for an answer. How long has Quareth been a shuttle pilot? Nerev coughed again. I believe the question you really want to ask is, how many successful landings has he made as a shuttle pilot? So he turned back to Nerif and smiled. A small smile, but a real one. And how many unsuccessful ones? He's never had an unsuccessful landing, Nerif said proudly, and he's flown over 200 missions, including one where a storm took out the autopilot and he had to hand navigate the dock with the ship. Though his eyes widened in appreciation, and she nodded. So, uh, he's not inexperienced, just young. Young is not a crime, Nera said softly. No, Zoe agreed, as she put her hands down on the table and looked at them. Young is not a crime. End of chapter. Part 9 Time is a variable element for humans. One human once explained it by saying, Put your hand on a hot stove for a minute and it seems like an hour. Sit with a pretty girl for an hour and it seems like a minute. The chemical soup that lives inside humans also allows them to slow time down to a very slow pace in times of emergency, allowing them to move, think, and act faster than their normal human reflexes would allow. Dubiak Review of Ontological Species Studies the Garen Feeding of Humans, Keeping Time in a Bottle, published by Glass and Steel, The Garen Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. At lunch, Nerev stopped by where Rural was eating. Hey, Rural, she said, as she slid onto the bench next to him. I need a discreet favor. Rural paused, his spoon partway up to his mouth. How discreet? I have no idea. You tell me. Nerev slid an envelope across the table to him, and he picked it up and looked inside. Oh, that is a discreet, he said after reading the note and counting the money. He glanced over to where the humans were sitting for lunch. He slipped the envelope into his pocket and nodded. I think I can do that. I'll send you something tonight. If it's not enough, then let me know, 
Nero said, but Rural just shook his head. This is fine. I charge less for all the interesting jobs, he said, and then smiled and went back to eating. Nero took a cue and slid away from him and then headed over to join the humans. That evening, when the humans headed to the gym, Zoe had paused as she grabbed her goggles. You should join us, Nareth. Join you? Why, you mean working out? Nareth asked. Zoe nodded. You and the boys, you should work out with us. Hey, Alan's face brightened. That's a great idea. Come on, it'll be fun. That was, as far as Nareth knew, the first time that Alan had lied to her. Working out was not fun. She'd called Quirith and Terif to join her, because if she was going to have to suffer to bond with humans, by all that was sacred, they would too. Zoe, after her look at Nate, had pulled on her goggles and started running again. Nate turned to Nareth and the boys. Great, how are you guys at climbing a rock wall? It turns out that Tariff was pretty darn good at climbing a rock wall. Must have some monkey in your gene pool, Tariff, Quirith had taunted. You are just jealous that monkeys never showed up in your family tree, Tariff had gasped while hanging from the wall. Quirif, of course, had taken to the fake water. It was actually real water, but it flowed at a force through a tiny rectangular pool. If you were wearing the goggles or shut your eyes, you could pretend that you were really swimming. Nate had called it an endless pool, and Nareth understood the concept once she saw Quirif swimming in it. No matter how far you swam, or you would never reach the end of it. Okay, Nareth, now you. What do you want to try? Nate asked, rubbing his hands together. Surfing, boating, weightlifting, or running? Nareth scratched her forehead where one of her feathers was tickling her. Why, exactly, would I ever want to use a boat or a surfboard when I can swim? Well, because it's fun. Oh, because the water's too cold for swimming, Nate explained. Nareth stared at him blankly. Too cold to swim, she repeated, just to be clear. Well, yes. If the water is near frozen, you are going to want to use a boat or a kayak or something, unless you're part penguin and don't care about the cold. Nareth shook her head. She remembered one time when the water temperature dropped to a little below 25 C, and that was a little chilly. But the concept of frozen water, she knew ice, of course, and used it in drinks, but had never wrapped her head around the entire ocean of ice. Nate saw her puzzled look and shook his head. Never mind, but after this expedition is done, we'll take you to Earth and you can see an iceberg carving. Then you'll understand kayaks. Nera had understood all the words that Nate had used, but she couldn't place them in context, except for the part about her visiting Earth. Why would any sane person want to go visit Earth, she thought. Just as Quer shouted, She's the head of our nest. We get to come too. Okay, Derek said. Let's put the boats and stuff out of the picture for right now. The heavy kick doesn't seem fun, but I guess at least the treadmill could be useful. She slipped on her goggles and started to run on the treadmill. She was no fool and wouldn't try and match Zoe's endurance, but she could at least... She stumbled a bit as the scene came up. She was running through a forest dirt and leaves under her feet and giant trees towering overhead. What is this place? she asked. It's beautiful. Alan made to have taken a break from helping Tara on the wall because he startled her, his voice coming from right beside her. The goggles say uh, Redwood Forest Earth. Oh, did you do that to make us feel at home? he asked. Tara swallowed. Yet standard protocol, but I never realized how beautiful Earth was. Nothing is going to jump out and chase me, is it? Alan laughed. You should be fine, bitch. Just a jogging program. After 15 minutes, Nareth was forced to stop. She was panting heavily, trying to cool down, and her feathers were fluffing out and smoothing down, trying to circulate the air to cool her off. Her legs were a little wobbly, and she sat down. Tariff and Quirif were already sitting down on the bench by the door, watching the humans. Quirif, she noticed, seemed perfectly fine. Of course, he'd been swimming in water. Tara was still panting a little, so she didn't feel so bad about her panting. You guys did great, Alan said, walking over to them. Tomorrow you should switch it up and try something new. T Tomorrow? Sh sure, Tara smiled, a pale copy of a normal smile. After Alan headed back to one of the torture devices, Nerev mattered to the boys. Tomorrow I get the fake water. 
The next day, Dareth was sore in places she didn't know existed. This, even though she and the boys had used the rejuvenation pod last night before bed. Quareth seemed fine, she noted sourly, and Dareth only winced if he had to use his arms. But Dareth hurt everywhere. As they headed for breakfast, Zoe noticed her pain. Nerif, I hope you're going to be swimming tonight. I am, Nerif said firmly. Zoe made a gesture with her hand, and Nate and Alan broke away from the group to fetch food and drink for everyone. Zoe, how is it that you have become the leader of the humans so quickly? You didn't even know each other two days ago. Easy, Zoe said with a smile. Our first night on board, I bought a fine selection of beers over to the boys' quarters. We drank, and once they were sufficiently drunk, I convinced them that I should be in charge. Convinced nothing, Nate groused as he brought the food pack. She pulled rank, plain and simple. Pulled rank? Quareth asked. Oh, are you the oldest, Zoe? Zoe turned a cool gaze on Quareth, and Nerif kicked him under the table. She glanced at Zoe and smiled as Quareth said, Oh! You're right, Zoe. Kicking works very well, Nerif said. She turned to her nester. You never ask a human female about her age. Oops. Uh, so- sorry, Zoe, Squareth said, though it was hard to tell how authentic his apology was, since he ducked his head below the table to check the damage to his leg. No problem, Zoe said. We didn't discuss age. I have the most mission experience, so I'm in charge. After breakfast, the boys headed out to do their jobs. Tariff promised them something special for lunch. Nerif kept an eye on the humans. And that's the way the days went. About a week in, they started getting live images from the ground station. Sometimes, Quareth couldn't take the evening workouts because he was running landing and docking simulations. Sometimes, Tariff begged off, claiming to be working on a new recipe. Since he always presented something nice at breakfast, Nerif didn't call him out on it. But she did notice that he only had to work on the special recipe on nights when he was supposed to be using the treadmill. Nerif attended all the workouts. Swimming was actually fun. Rock climbing was challenging. She never did get surfing down, and the treadmill was the bane of her existence. Zoe only ever used the treadmill, and Nerif was afraid to ask if it was because of her arm that she had to avoid water and rock wall climbing. And then... It was the night before landfall. Just a light workout tonight, Zoe declared. Make sure you are packed before you go to bed and that you have everything your packing lists checked off. Alan had given everyone packing lists two days ago, and Nerif had immediately packed her bags. That night, in bed, Quareth and Tariff dropped off to sleep immediately, but Nerif couldn't do it. She finally got out and headed up to the common room, hoping to find a soothing drink to help her sleep. At this time of night, the common room should be empty, but she wasn't surprised to walk in and find Zoe sitting at one of the tables, drinking a cup of something that smelled wonderful. And that was how, on the night before landfall, Nero found her first cup of hot chocolate. She and Zoe drank in silence, and Nero wondered if she should bring up the info that Rarul had gotten about Zoe. Instead, she let it slide, and the two of them just shared the night and the chocolate and whatever worries they had about tomorrow, they kept to themselves. End of chapter. Part 10 Humans have a natural instinct for where things are, when they are on an expedition. This includes large things like sunrise and sunset, but also little things like where the next biohazard life form will be coming from. No one is sure if this is instinct, psychic ability, or if the human senses are just sharp enough to pull that information together. The lesson is, you pay a lot of money to hire humans to be on your team. Listen to them. The Vic Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, The Strange Thing the Dog Did in the Night, published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans. Translation Engine 3.14159 The captain met them in the shuttle dock. Do your best to collect samples. Do your best not to die. And remember, it's only been classed as a two or a three planet. And it looks like a two or three planet. So you know that means that somebody screwed up. And there will probably be lots of unexpected things that try to kill you. As a speech of inspiration or motivation, Dareth thought that it was lacking. 
as sane advice for an expedition, she thought that it was probably perfect. The captain then gravely shook his hands with each person on the mission, and then only the tail twitch revealed any excitement about being able to participate in this human ritual. Nara thought maybe she and the boys weren't the only ones excited to be working with the humans. Zoe checked and double-checked the droids, the food, and the other supplies. After she was done, Alan, who'd been doing something in the co-pilot seat with Quarif supervising, came out and checked the food supplies. Tariff didn't even blink when Nate swung by a little later just to uh, do a final check. Tariff showed Nate the food supplies and how they were stored on the shuttle, and then it was time to strap in. While waiting for the dock bay to open, Tariff reviewed her packing list in her mind. Then the shuttle shuddered and it was too late to check and see if she really had packed that washcloth with the blue spirals. Landing was as simple as Tariff had come to expect from the Nesta. Alan was sitting up front with Quarif and Nate when Tariff were sitting next to the seats discussing the merits of Earth's musical group called Queen. There were no women in that group, Tariff asked. Oh, not royalty either, Nate confirmed. So why were they called Queen? Did, did the Queen land their country mind, Tariff asked. Nate scoffed. Yes, she was flattered they named themselves Queen. They were the best ever. Tariff sounded doubtful. We have some great music on our world, he pointed out. Nerif laughed. You've obviously never heard, Queen. I'll play some for you tonight, and you'll agree that they are the best ever. Nerif tuned the rest of the conversation out, but she was looking forward to hearing Queen tonight. She glanced at Zoe. She and Zoe were in the last row of chairs, and Zoe's face was serene. She looked at the display for the shuttle view in front of her and seemed fine. Nerif was about to glance away when she noticed that Zoe's hands were firmly clasped around the armrests. The knuckles on her left hand were paler than the rest of her skin, and the armrest under her right hand seemed to be dented. Once they had landed, Zoe was the first to unbuckle. She stood up and said, Feel free to unbuckle, but do not disembark just yet. Nate, meet me in the cargo bay. Nerif trailed into the cargo bay, where Zoe and Nate were unpacking one of the droids. Zoe was sinking a combat with the droid and then turned to Nate and said, Okay, let loose. Zoe, what are you doing with that droid? Nerif asked. Just doing a little lightweight scouting. If there's nothing out there, the droid won't have a problem. If there's something out there, better the droid than us. Nerif nodded and helped Nate load the droid into the exit chute. Then they moved back into the main body of the ship. Quarif, Zoe said, would you please put the droid camera up on the main screen? Oh good, movie night, Alan said. I wish I'd brought popcorn. Tariff moved into the cargo hold and came back with a bag which he handed to Alan. Is this, um, Alan said as he looked in the bag. It is. Tariff, you whiny little Linnead. He showed everyone the bag. Look, Tariff has popcorn. That's good, Zoe said, perching one hip on the armrest of the chair. You go ahead and enjoy. Her gaze was fixed on the screen which showed the droid's camera as it moved about the area. At some point, she had unloaded a few weapons from the cargo hold. She passed one over to Nate and one to Alan, keeping two for herself. Her eyes fixed on the screen. She strapped one to her leg and held the bigger one in her right hand. The droid moved over to the beach where the shuttle had landed, moving around the sand. It eventually moved out further and further away until it reached the edge of the jungle. It stopped at the jungle edge and scanned into the trees. Nothing appeared to be moving, and there was nothing visible in the IR display. No life at all, so he said. Well, I guess that's to be expected when a big shuttle comes roaring down and lands in your backyard. Probably everything has to run away. Okay, everyone listen up. Here's the marching order. Droid, 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 fanned out in front of me. He, then Nerif, then Tariff, then Quarif, Nate, and Alan. You fan out in the rear. Let's move out before whatever used to live here decides to come back home. If anyone hears anything, that I mean, even the wind, you make sure that we know. Nate rolled his eyes. Zoe, no offense to the roofs, but we're all here long before they do. Zoe glared at Nate. Nate. I'm telling you right now, drop the humans or badasses of the universe, shtick. Everyone has skills to offer. Have I made myself clear? 
Nate gritted his jaws together, and Narev could see the muscles on his cheek flex. Yes, sir. Okay, so he said, apparently not even noticing Nate's anger. Let's move out. Quarrow, button this up as soon as we're out. I don't want anyone sneaking in while we're gone. If any of you get tired or start to hurt, let me know immediately. Understood? Sir? Yes, sir. Sure, no problem. Okay. Quarrow opened the rear hatch and they all walked out, roughly in formation that Zoe had described. Once on the beach, which was a firmer, harder grain sand than Nerif knew from her home beaches, Quarrow used his compad to close it back up. Let's go, Zoe said. Her voice was firm but quiet. Nerif shivered and tried to imagine anything that was scary enough to intimidate Zoe. Once they caught up with the droid at the edge of the jungle, Zoe pulled out her compad and sent some instructions. This droid is our scout. It's headed towards the ground station. It's going to mark out a trail for us, as long as we follow its trail. Zoe held up a compad with a map showing. A line of little red dots showed up everywhere the droid had wandered. It should be fine for some kinds of nasty surprises. Zoe patted the droid. Okay, little buddy, find us a good route. The droid beeped in acknowledgement of the order and trundled off. Quarif raised his hands like he was asking a question in school. He asked Quarif, Um, shouldn't we be collecting samples for the expedition? Zoe shook her head. Not yet. On the way, we're just scouting out the lay of the land, what kinds of creatures live here, and taking the battery to the ground station. Once we're established at the ground station, and on our way back, we'll collect as many samples for the scientists back on the ship as we can. Zoe held her larger weapon in her right hand but not down low. It seemed that Zoe was ready to aim and shoot at any moment. Nera looked and noticed that both Alan and Nate had their weapons out too. She pulled her dagger out of its sheath and nodded to Querif and Terif to do the same. They walked into the jungle, every sense alert and ready and waiting for what might come. And nothing happened. Terif finally put his knife back in his sheath. Querif followed. A few minutes later, Nate and Alan didn't put their weapons away but they carried them lower. Only Zoe seemed to still be alert, though. Nerif thought the fact that she was carrying her weapon with her prosthetic arm maybe meant that she wasn't tiring of carrying it. At one point, Zoe said, Did anyone see that? She pointed a little way to the right of the path, and there held her compad to scan the area. Alan followed suit, but Nade scanned all of the other areas around him. Ah, Nerif thought. This way nothing can sneak up on us, by distracting everyone to look the wrong direction. Nothing visible to my scad, Zoe, Nate said. Mine either, Zoe said. It might have been the wind moving a branch, but I don't want to believe that for one second. Let's take a rest for a few minutes and see who's more patient. Nerif sat down on one of the porter droids with some relief. She hadn't realized that she was getting tired, and she had promised Zoe that she would let her know if that happened. I'm glad you called the rest, Zoe, Nerif said. I didn't realize that I was getting tired. Zoe glanced away from the compad for a moment and smiled at Nerif. It can sneak up on you. Well, we'll stay here for a little bit. Nerif used a compad too. She was scanning for all types of bioforms, but the only things showing up were plants. She remembered hearing about some plants on Earth that seemed like plants, but would catch and eat animals and narrowed her eyes at the plants. If they were like those plants, she would make sure that they didn't catch her team. She was scanning the tree canopy when she got an alert on a compad. Zoe, she said very quietly, there's something in the trees. I think it's watching us. End of chapter. Part 11. Humans seem impervious to the emotion of fear, at least for themselves. When faced with a situation that would cause other species to turn and run to safety, the humans play music. If they don't have mechanical methods to play music, they will sing or whistle. They call this whistling in the graveyard, or whistling in the dark. This trait seems to serve no survival purpose at all. Dubiak, Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Gare and Feeding of Humans, Where Words Fail, Music Speaks, published by Glass and Steel, The Gare and Feeding of Humans. Zoe sent one of the droids in the direction to the tree lurker. It flew away long before the droid got close enough to get any good images. Well, Nerif said, that's a good sign, isn't it? We probably won't be attacked by a shy flying thing that'll leave when you get the droid too close. 
Obviously, you've never heard of magpies or mockingbirds during mating or nesting seasons, Nate said. And if hummingbirds were the size of crows, the human race would have been killed off a long time ago, Alan added. Those little suckers are mead. I pulled camera data from our scout droid. I think there's a clearing ahead. We should probably make camp there, Zoe said. She tapped her combat, and the possible camp spot appeared on all their maps. It will probably be another hour before we can get there, she added, looking at Nareth. Will you be okay? No, oh, sure. Nareth stood up to demonstrate that she could walk for another hour. <sighs> another hour. Zoe looked at the boys. How about you two? Are you up for it? Of course, Nareth said, waving his hands in the air. We're full of energy, see? He bounced up and down a little. Once they hit the clearing, Alan set the droids up to monitor the perimeter of the clearing, calling back the droid that had been the scout droid. Nerif and Quarif started popping up a tent, laying out the energy nodes in a roughly circular pattern that took up most of the clearing. You know, Quarif said as he laid out three more energy nodes, it would only take a failure of one of these nodes to take the whole tent down. Let's hope that that doesn't happen then, Nerif said. All better idea, said Zoe, who was setting out a smaller concentric circles of energy nodes. Let's use a backup tent inside the main tent. There's no protocol for having an energy field in an energy field, Quirif said. That's because they didn't have Zoe write the protocols, Nate said. He was standing in the middle of the circle, turning slowly and keeping an eye on the compact strapped to his arm, as well as scanning the trees for signs of a threat. He held up his weapon easily, and he looked ready for anything that might attack. They were fools. So he smiled at the ground as she laid out more nodes. I, Nate, I didn't know you cared. I care about keeping my skin intact. I care about keeping everyone's skin intact. That's why I agreed you should be the boss, Nate said, a small smile on his lips. Once the nodes were laid out, Zoe called everyone into the center of the clearing. She touched a compad and a soft blue light played up around them, creating an upside-down ball of light. Then she tapped a couple more times, and a light green light emerged from the slightly smaller ring, and they were suddenly standing in the middle of two circles of light. The color shifted and danced in greens and blues, and Nareth was suddenly homesick for summer nights under the water. That's cool, Alan said. It reminds me of the Aurora Borealis. It's basically the same concept, so he said. Only the Aurora Borealis is electrons banging against our magnetic field, and this is electrons banging against everything. You have something like this on Earth? Tariff asked, his voice quiet. Near the top and the bottom, yeah. You could live your whole life on Earth and never see it, Talon said, if you live in the wrong place, anyway. As the sun dropped lower, Tariff started making dinner. Nate set up a light in the middle of the circle. What's that for? Zoe asked. It's a campfire. You can't have a camp out without a campfire. You can't have a real fire in an energy tent, and we wouldn't set up a source of light outside the tent where it might draw. Nate hesitated and substituted a new word for whatever he had been about to say. Attention, so, um... Nate bent over and touched the switch on the right which changed the glow from a steady light to a flickering light. Ta-da! Instant campfire! If only we could toast marshmallows, this would be perfect, Alan said. Tariff pulled the bag out and handed it to Alan. Really? Marshmallows, Tariff. You're awesome. I thought these weren't available on ships with Krell because they have a problem with one of the ingredients. It's the vanilla extract, Tariff said. However, I was able to convince the shuttle that since none of us are Krell, marshmallows can be on the shuttle. We just have to make sure we eat them all before we go back to the ship. Such a hardship, Alan sighed. He set the bag aside until after dinner with a little pat. Dinner was good stew with some hearty bread, but a few bites into her dinner, Zoe set hers and stood up. The scout droid should return by now, Zoe said, looking out in the deepened dark. She pulled her compad and started some impressive swearing. Nara pulled out her compad and a quick glance showed everyone else was putting up the info on the scout droid too. The lights then marked the path had stopped moving. Pulling the camera for the droid view showed a still image of a sideways view of the forest. The last frame of whatever the droid had filmed before stopping. Nerif backed the camera up a bit and saw only a long shadow fall in front of the droid. Then the image bucked and flipped. 
The droid had the capability to right itself, in case it fell over or was knocked over in some way, but it looked like the camera didn't move at all, once the droid had been flipped. Nate, Alan, you stay here with the rips. I'll head out and find out what happened to the droid. If I don't make it back by sunrise, I want you to take them back to the shuttle and then use your best judgment to come and fight me or leave the planet, so he said. She was strapping back on the weapon, taken off for dinner. Aren't you supposed to say, hold my beer? Dara asked. Zoe had her foot up on the chair so that she could strap the holster onto her leg, but she stopped and looked up. What? The book said that when humans are about to do something really stupid, they're supposed to say, hold my beer. So I ask you again, if you're going to do something this stupid, aren't you supposed to say, hold my beer? Nerev said, and lifted up her chin a little at the end, heading off into a strange forest on a strange world in the middle of the night. It's very dark, Zoe pointed out. In the dark, Nerev continued, when who knows what has killed our droid. A machine, I'll point out, that is built to take a lot of punishment. Does that seem like a smart idea to you? Zoe put her foot back down on the ground. It's possible that it's not the best idea I've had today, she admitted. Okay, let's spend the night here. Tomorrow we'll find the droid together and decide what to do from there, Nareff said. How about we wait until morning and then we'll make decisions from there, Zoe said. But tonight I don't think that we should rely on the droids alone to keep wash. Three shifts. I'll take the middle shift. Who wants first shift? After some sorting around, Alan and Quirov got first shift, Nerif and Zoe got middle shift, and Nate and Tariff got the early morning shift. Because, as Terran pointed out, he was getting up early to make breakfast anyway. Tariff picked up a bag of marshmallows off the ground. Alan had dropped them when the kerfuffle about the scoundroid had started. He did want to try roasted marshmallows. Maybe tomorrow. Nara pulled out a compad and let the ship know what was going on. The signal dropped a few times, but she was able to confirm with the ship that the droid had been unexpectedly decommissioned, as they put it. Zoe was already asleep, and Alan and Quirif were playing a game of cards. It looked like a game of catch and snuff, but Alan was insisting it was called Go Fish. Nara woke up a few hours later to a low moaning sound. She sat up and saw Zoe, Nate, and Alan standing by the campfire light. Someone had switched it back from flickering to a low but steady light. Quirif waved at Nerif, and Nerif walked over to the group. What's that noise? What's going on? Nerif asked. We think it's some sort of electrical storm, Nate said. Look at the lights. He gestured up to the lights of the tent, and Nerif saw that they were stronger and moving faster than they had been when the tents were first set up. I thought this planet didn't have any storms, Nero said slowly. Oh no, it has storms, Nate said, but a little bitterness in his voice. It just hasn't had any storms for nine freaking months, and the night we land on this planet, the mother of storms decides to hit. And here, Nate raised his voice to a shout, because the universe freaking hates me that much. Tara finally woke up when Nate started yelling. Alan pulled Nate aside. It's just a storm. Uh, there's worse storms than this every day. No big deal. Yeah, Nate sighed. You're right. No big deal. Cause humans, they're badasses of the universe, Adam said with a smile, though in a voice soft enough that Zoe wouldn't be likely to overhear. We have incredibly strong acid and we can just carry around in our guts, Nate replied back, equally softly. And we burn ourselves with radiation as a mating ritual, Alan returned. Well, not you, Alan, so he said, proving that her hearing was better than either Nate or Alan had expected, anyway. Had aren't you ever done more than fifty minutes on a sun tanning at a time? Nero realized that even though Zoe had forbidden Nate from talking about the strengths of humans, right now she was using it to diffuse the anger and fear that everyone had been feeding. The humans were, Nero realized, with a wave of excitement, whistling in the dark. Right then is when the particularly large nighty bolt struck one of the nodes, and the first tent went out. End of chapter. Part 12 Humans have the ability to feel two or more emotions at once. There is a theory that this means that they have less emotional depth than other species, there is an equally loud group that says this means humans have a greater emotional depth than other species. Direct observation tends to indicate that the first theory is correct, 
as well as cry about things that they know are fake. See human movies, especially Old Yeller and Bambi. Beings of great emotional depth would save their emotions for real events and beings. Dubiuk, review of ontological species studies, the Garen feeling of humans, tears of a clown. Published by Glass and Steel, the Garen feeding of humans. Translation engine 3.14159. Zoe swore and passed through the barrier of the remaining tent. Nerif grabbed a weapon and followed her out and then reconsidered her rash action. Outside the tent, sound of storm was horrific and the rain and the wind that beat against her skin was painful. But what she noticed most was the cold. The wind seemed to pass right through her, not taking the time to go around her body. And Nerif shivered. Zoe didn't seem to notice only pulling her hair out of her face to pick up the damaged energy node. She turned it over in her hands before standing up and noticing Nerif. Nerif, what the hell are you doing out here? Zoe demanded. Get back inside. I'm gone at you, Nerif yelled back through the storm. Come on, Zoe said and grabbed Nerif's arm and pulled her back into the tent. Nerif had the briefest glimpse of what the tent looked like from outside the energy nodes. A black field of nothingness before she was inside of the working tent again. She was streaming wet, as was Zoe, but she was also cold. She shivered again and couldn't stop, and her teeth started chattering. The wet didn't bother her. Any limnead would welcome her wet, but the cold seemed to be seeping into her very bones. Alan wrapped her in a blanket and ordered Tariff to make a hot drink, while Quirif helped her sit down on the ground. Tariff brought the drink over quickly. His eyes worried at the feathers fluffed out in concern. Nerif grabbed the mug gratefully and started drinking. It was tea, both hot and sweet, and it seemed to help combat the cold that had gripped her. Quarif and Tariff huddled around her, trying to help warm her up. What about Zoe? Tariff asked when she could talk again. Is Zoe okay? She pushed Quarif out of the way so that she could see what was happening to Zoe. Quarif and Tariff moved out of the way, and Nerif could see that Zoe seemed fine. Nate and Alan were conferring with Zoe over the damaged energy node. The only concession Zoe had made to the experience was a damp towel that she had evidently used to strip some water from her hair and face. Zoe looked up and saw Nerif watching her and headed over. Nerif, how are you feeling? Zoe asked crouching down next to her. Fine, better, she corrected herself. It was just so cold. I never felt anything like that. Zoe shook her head. Nerif, you hired us for certain skills. You have to let us do our job. Your kind wasn't built for those temperatures. To us, it's not even that cold. Nerif looked down, feathers flat. But thank you, Zoe said, for watching my back. Xenos don't always do that. In fact, almost never. So, uh, thank you. And she smiled. Nera thought back to the details Varul had given her about Zoe's past missions and opened her mouth to say something, but then closed it again. Maybe this wasn't the best time. You're welcome, she said finally. So, about the tent? Alan looked up from where the now opened energy module, multi tool in hand. Oh, yeah, he said. It's fried. I've never actually seen anything like this. He poked at the guts of the energy node. It's basically welded to itself. Melted. These things are supposed to be tougher than that. They can withstand lightning strikes on Earth, no problem. At his words, everyone looked up at the night sky. The energy field's lights were strong and moved in the fast bolts that came across the dome. The green from the first tent were gone and now the colors were only blue. Nerif wondered how long this tent would hold. If it went down, she didn't think she and her nesters would be able to survive the cold for long. Okay, so he said. Let's pull the remaining nodes, check them for damage, and if they're okay, we'll set up another tent inside this one. I'm already wet, so I'll grab them. Nate, do you have my back? Nate nodded and pulled out his weapon. Always. Nerif watched Zoe walk out through the tent and started picking up the nodes. She couldn't toss them to Nate, since the tent force field would prevent them from going in, so she picked up a few at a time and carried them in. Then she'd go back out for more. While Nate guarded Zoe, 
Alan inspected the notes that Zoe brought in and directed Querif and Tariff to set up another perimeter inside their existing tent. When everyone was done, Alan had pulled three nodes from service, and they had two tents up again. The smaller tent had colors of blue and purple. Three nodes in one strike, so he said. Yeah, Alan agreed. No one could sleep, with the storm raging like some sort of living monster attacking the tent. Nerif imagined a creature actually attacking them and shivered again. Nerif, do you need more tea? Alan asked, noticing her shiver. No, thank you, she smiled. I'm just scaring myself with the storm. Late was chewing on a stick of dried fruit concoction that Teref had made as a dessert snack. He paused and gave her a wink. No need to worry with us around. We got you covered. Zoe made an impatient noise but didn't say anything. After a long time, the sky started to lighten up and the storm dipped in intensity and finally died. When the sun finally rose, the raindrops that decorated the trees captured a million rainbows and Nerev sucked in her breath. What is it? Zoe asked. It's so beautiful, Nerev said. Zoe looked around, seeming to notice it for the first time. Yeah, I guess it is. They backed up the droids and started following the trail left by the now defunct scout droid. I don't expect we'll find any traces of what damaged the droid after that storm, Zoe said. But we'll see. As they got closer to the spot where the droid's trail died on the map, Zoe motioned everyone to stop. Let's just look around a little before charging in unannounced, she said. This time, the droid that was picked as a scout was only sent a little ways ahead of them. Nate scanned the trees for any large flying creatures. Zoe held a weapon in both hands, and Alan watched the view from the droid's camera. As they approached the fallen droid, nothing startled or ran away. Checking out the treetops revealed no birds. But as they approached the droid, Zoe stopped. Can anyone else hear that? she asked. Nate cocked his head. I can. Alan nodded slowly. Me too. It sounds like... he stopped. Nerif looked at the nesters and then shook their heads. None of them could hear what the humans heard. But as they got a few feet away from the droid, Nerif finally heard it. Is the droid crying? she asked. It's not the droid, Alan said. Hang on. He moved around to the other side of the droid. Oh, poor baby. Don't worry, he crooned. The sound of cries changed as a hiss as Alan moved closer to whatever it was. It's pinned under the droid, he said. Someone help me. Nate moved around and grabbed the huge tree limb from the storm fallen debris and helped Alan pry the droid up. Alan stood up, his hands full of a small, bedraggled, sandy-colored, fur-covered creature. He looked up at Zoe. It's a kitten, he said, and Zoe groaned. Don't say it, she warned. Alan, do not say it. Look what followed me home, Mom. Can we keep it? he asked. Zoe put her head back in her hands. Well, Quarif pointed out, we are supposed to get life form samples, if possible. End of chapter. Part 13 Even if you hire a perfect expedition group of humans, it is likely that they will still need a companion animal. If you do not purchase the animal yourself, they are likely to find one on their own, even in the middle of an expedition on a death world. When a human finds a pet, they will bring it on board with the human ritual phrase, no one follow me home, can we keep him? Despite being phrased as a question and having the uplifted tone at the end of the sentence, this is not an actual question. Or more precisely, it is what the humans call a rhetorical question, which means a question that needs no answer. See also koans, questions with no answers that need an answer. Do not forbid the pet. See the logs of the tragic examples of Expedition Deathworld Severed, Expedition Forbidden, and Expedition Silence for a deeper understanding of what happens when humans are denied their pets. Also, refer to the history of the Glint and why they are no longer allowed to hire humans under any circumstances. There is some speculation that humans, whether instinctively or psychologically, have an understanding when they are admittedly impressive, if not scary, Biological weaponry is inefficient to a task at hand, 
and adopt these pets out of an unknown need to fill that weapon gap. This would explain why so many of the pets are carnivore predators or otherwise dangerous to sane and rational beings. Many humans will have scars of their encounters with the pets, despite the famous healing ability inherent to all humans. Whether or not they have a companion around, humans will still pack bond it appropriately. They'll pack bond with equipment, weapons, engines, computers, androids, and so forth. If your humans are bonding inappropriately, first check to see if they have the correct amount of human-to-human -human social time for their type. Humans are spread across the spectrum of social interaction needs. If they are getting the appropriate amount of social interaction with other humans, check to see if they are getting enough social interaction time with other non-human beings of the crew. Whenever possible, you want to encourage pack bonds with the crew, since this will cause humans to work harder to protect the crew. To be a review of ontological species studies, the care and feeding of humans, human companions, Published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.144159. Nera walked over to where Zoe was investigating a damage on the droid. Alan scanned the creature and is determined that it was female, carnivorous and hungry. He also has a name for it. Zoe looked up at Nera. By named it, I don't suppose you mean he's giving it a biological classification name like uh, Zeno Felicta Zeno, am I right? Nera smiled. You are correct. He has decided the name Dino. Dino, what the? So he glanced over at everyone else who was gathered around the kitten and making noises. Did he say why he named it Dino? I believe it had to do with the old TV show. There were some dinosaurs? Nera wasn't sure. So he turned back to the droid. The Flintstones had a dinosaur named Dino. Have you found out what happened to the droid yet? Nera asked. Nothing good, that's for sure. Look at this. Zoe used her right arm and flipped the droid over, so it went upside down. See how the metal was ripped, here, here, and here. Are those from... teeth? Nara asked. Teeth, claws, talons. Not good. On Earth, we have creatures that can tear into metal like this with their claws and teeth, but they're usually going after food. Because this droid was carrying some of our supplies, it might have smelled like food. But the way it flipped it over after the attack, and the rips are on the undercarriage, it seems that the creature thought the droid was alive and wanted to start on the soft underbelly. Nerf said, I'm sorry, did you just say that there are animals on earth that can rip metal open? Meh, so he said, and then stood up and dusted off her hands. Bears mostly, but there are a number of creatures that can rip a car open. What I want to know, so he said, was it Dino's mom that ripped up the droid? And will she be coming after us because we have a baby? Maybe, Nate said, walking up to them. I have walked around, I didn't find any post-storm tracks, and I didn't find any other kittens. Thank goodness, so he said. Alan would want to adopt them all. Hey, Nate said. I was looking for a kitten for me. I want one. Zoe just shook her head. Let's get the droid loaded up. Once we get to the ground station, I want to see if we can get more info on its internal history. Nate and Zoe carried the dead droid over to the other two remaining droids and strapped it on top. Nerev headed back over to Alan and the kitten, and Zoe headed over soon after. I know, huh? She asked Alan. Alan shook his head and grinned. Name change. The roof said that Dino was a dumb neighbor. They want to name it Fubsby. Fubsby? Zoe said. Is that even a word? It means just what it sounds like. Look at the little Bubsby. Who's a little Bubsby? You are. You're a little Busby. Alan replied, rubbing his head against the kitten. Ow, 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 ow. Her claws are stuck. Ow. Alan said. Nerf took a step back. She knew. She knew this was a predator. But some part of her had believed that it wouldn't try and kill people until it was older. It's attacking Alan, Nerf said worried and wondering why no one else seemed concerned. No, it's not, Zoe said, and picked up the kitten, expertly detangling the claws from Alan's head. She's just playing. Playing? Narav couldn't believe her ears. Alan is bleeding. Look at his head. Zoe glanced at Alan and smiled. Go disinfect yourself. Zoe held Pubsby in her left arm, not seeming to notice the kitten squirming around and trying to chew on her thumb. 
Tariff, have you been able to determine what this little fuzzball eats? Tariff nodded. We scanned her, and we are giving her carnival formula one. Zoe nodded and then glanced at Tariff. You just happen to have infant carnival formula one in stock. Tariff coughed a little nervously. Well, the book said that humans were prone to adopt predators, so we shrugged with one shoulder. Feathers flat. I figured it wouldn't hurt to bring a selection of formulas. Besides, I use a lot of them as stock in my soups and gravies. Okay, so he said. I'm not sure what it says about humans, but your food is delicious, so I won't complain. Anyway, I think she's still hungry. More hungry again. Alan, come take your problem, child, and feed her. Alan came over, disinfected goo stuck to his hair and a couple of dots in his face. There was a little struggle when it turned out the Busby didn't want to let go of Zoe. Zoe looked up at Narev, who made a noise during the extraction and said, What's up? I find the hissing to be very disturbing for some reason, Narev admitted. Ah, oh, it just means that she doesn't want to leave mommy Zoe, do you, little Pubsby? Alan was theoretically talking to Narev, but he was looking at the kitten, Pubsby. Narev corrected herself and talking in a tone of voice that didn't make any sense to Narev. Why is he talking like that? she asked Zoe. Sadly, humans do that tone of voice to anything that seems young, helpless, and possibly cute. Our own young and the young of most other species, sapient or not, Zoe sighed. Helpless? She drew blonde, Narev pointed out. Zoe shrugged. Not very much, and it wasn't like she was trying to hurt him. But are you trying to say is that if she wanted to hurt him, she would have drawn more blood, Narev asked. She knew what the book said about humans and pets. She had memorized that part. She just couldn't help thinking that the kitten was a very bad idea. No, she's too little, so he said. And um, when it gets bigger, Narev asked. Well, that's always going to happen, so he said. There's nothing we can do to stop it. Besides, what other options do we have? She's going to die out there with her mother. If we find her mother, we will give Fubsby back. If we don't find her mother, Zoe shrugged. Until her mother shows up, though, we need to start moving. There's a possibility that we can make the ground station before dark tonight. Even though it hadn't ended well last night, they still had to send one of the droids out as a scout. Alan hooked up a couple additional cameras on the new scout droid. If something attacked this time, they'd be able to see what it was. They headed out into the same formation that they'd used the day before. Nareth was close enough to Alan to notice that the kitten must have finally gotten enough to eat, because she was sleeping in a sling that Alan had rigged up around his chest. Asleep, and not making that disturbing hissing noise, Nareth could admit that Fubsby was cute, but, um... Alan, when you found Fubsby, wasn't she a solid sandy color? Nareth asked. Alan looked down at the little sand and black striped fur ball that he was carrying. Yeah, she was. He paused for a minute and said, Huh, that's weird. Kittens don't normally change their fur pattern in such a short time. Other than that comment, he didn't seem concerned. For the first time, Nero felt some kinship with other beings that had felt frustrated with humans. End of chapter. Okay, this one's recorded slightly after the previous one, so um, all that stuff, plus some more, and some added time. Anyways, on to the noms. I hope you enjoy. The Care and Feeding of Humans, Part 14 Humans have the capacity for improvisation. When things break or when they fail, humans have an inherent ability to put in improbable items together to create a solution. One of their heroes is famous for being able to create and fix almost any problem with tape and a knife. His name has become synonymous for creating solutions with the least amount of materials available. To be a review of ontological species studies, the guarantee feeding of humans, tape holds the universe together. Published by Glass and Steel, the guarantee feeding of humans. Translation engine 3.14159. When the second droid was attacked, at least this time they got video on the camera that was pointed at the sky. What had been a small dot in the sky turned into a brief image of feathers and the darkness. As the giant bird took out the droid. When they caught up the wreckage of the droid, Nerif noticed that Tariff was looking worried. What's wrong? 
she asked him. We've lost two droids in two days and almost all of their supplies. I'm sure we can get by on what we have left, but I like having the comfort of knowing that we have extra supplies. Nara looked at the humans. I'll let them know about the supply situation, she told Anesta. Tara frowned at her. I can do it, he said. Nara shook her head. I know that you can do it, but as the liaison, it is my job to do it, she said. Nara walked up to where Quarif and Alan were examining the wreckage while Zoe looked on and Nate scanned the forest and the sky around them. I'm afraid the supplies are getting close to being an issue, Nara began, and Zoe gave her a sharp look. What do you mean? We've lost two droids in two days. One and a half, really. Theoretically, we could make it on the supplies on the one droid, but I thought I should call out that it may be an issue, especially if we lose the last droid tomorrow. Zoe smiled. I didn't send the droid out with our supplies. We split them up in our packs and they're still in good shape. However, she frowned a little, we did pack damaged parts of the first droid into the second droid. We're running out of room to carry droid parts. To say nothing of the fact that the last droid looked like it was attacked from the sky, and the first droid looked like it was attacked from the ground. Zoe, Nate interrupted, I am not liking the look of the sky. Nara looked up at the sky and saw dark clouds, almost purple against the noon sky. Streaks of light appeared in the clouds and Nara shivered, remembering last night's storm. Back home, Nate said, we'd call that a supercell. Yeah... Zoe agreed. And based on last night, it's probably going to feel like one. Let's set our tents up under the trees. The false field should keep any of the fallen branches from crashing into us. And maybe the trees will take the lightning hit instead of the tent. Fubs be woke up while everyone was working to set up the two-tier tent system, as she objected to having to stay in Alan's thing. Once the tents were up, however, Alan was able to let her walk around freely and explore. The first thing she discovered was that she couldn't walk outside the boundaries of the tent. Not having a combat, the tent didn't recognize her as being that would have allowed in and out of the tent. This seemed to make Fubsby angry, and she tried to clawing at the force field, to no avail. After a few scratches that did nothing, Fubsby stopped and licked herself. After a few licks, she got distracted by Alan waving his fingers at her. She pounced at his fingers. Alan pulled them away and then waved them again at her encouraging her to pounce. Alan, what are you doing? You are teaching the carnival that your body is a toy for attacking. Nerf said, worry clear on her face and in her voice. Alan is the biggest cat toy in the world, Nate said, while Zoe said, Alan, cut it out. You know better than that. Alan's ears turned red, but his grin didn't lessen. Okay, I got a better toy for her. He took a piece of the trash that had been in the bag and held one of Terra's creations and crumpled it. Come on, Bubsby, he called out and threw the ball past her. Bubsby, who had been considering attacking Nara's clothes, whirled around and darted after the crumpled ball and pounced. Evidently, getting much satisfaction from crunching sound the ball made when she landed on it. She proudly pranced back to Alan, the ball in her mouth, and dropped it in front of him. Good girl, he said. Good Bubsby. The next time Busby brought the ball back, she brought it to Zoe. The time after that, much to Nara's surprise, Bubsby brought the ball to her. When Bubsby got tired of bringing the ball back and just sat down and started trying to chew on it, Alan deftly swapped the ball for a small plate of infant carnival Formula One. After eating, Bubsby washed herself and then walked away. She's looking for a place to sleep, Alan explained. Just leave her be, she'll be fine. Nara wasn't sure ignoring a predator, no matter how small, was the best idea. However, later, she spied the sleeping on Zoe's lap and Nara thought that it was the best solution. Zoe would know how to deal with Bubsby if she did anything that wasn't cute and adorable and reeked of an apex predator. Since they'd been forced to make camp in the middle of the day, Nara wasn't really tired enough to sleep but found she didn't have a lot of other things to do this early either. Nate and Zoe had just finished discussing something while Zoe held her hand over Fubsby's sleeping body. Nerev headed over to her. I feel lost, she said. I don't really have anything to do until Tariff is done making the midday meal. Zoe smiled. Being bored on an expedition is pretty rare. 
Enjoy it before the storm hits. Nareff glanced up at the sky, seen through the shifting colors of the tent force fields. The storm had lost none of its impressive size and seemed bigger and closer now. Nareff shivered just a little. Zoe noticed and said, Nate is working on jerry-rigging something for you in the rifts and maybe a little Bubsby here. Bubsby made a small noise in his sleep, evidently in response to her name. If it works the way we hope, it should help you and the boys in case we have some more storm problems. He might want some help if you need something to distract you from the storm. Curious, Nareff looked over at Nate. As far as she could tell, Nate was taking all the trash and taping it together. Nareff walked over to him. Nate, what are you doing? He looked up and smiled. Hey, Nareff, uh, making you and the boys some warming suits. It looks like you're taping trash together, Nareff said, doubt clear in her voice. Not just any trash, Nate said in mock hurt. This is old food trash, stuff that Tariff has been using to keep the food hot or cold, so it still tastes good when we eat it. Now, just one bag over your hand will be like a mitten, a covering to keep your hand warm, he said. When he saw her confused knock, if you tape a bunch of them together and then shape them like clothes, Nate draped a long piece of trash around Nareff's and taped it. Ta-da! Nareff felt the warmth from the food-ready bag soaking into her. She wasn't cold at the moment, so this would quickly become hot, but she could imagine how warm it would be if she got caught in the cold rain again. This... this is amazing, Nareff said, rubbing her hand over the top layer of tape and bags. How did you even think of this? Zoe and I kicked, kicked some ideas around until we figured out a way to MacGyver a thermal suit for you three. Plus, we have a little one for the kitten too. Hopefully, we won't need to use them. But, you know, just in case. Nera headed back to Zoe, who was absentmindedly petting Bumsby. Zoe, thank you so much for the thermal suit, Nera said. Zoe looked up at her and smiled, but it seemed a sad smile and didn't make it to her eyes. Thank you, Nareff, for following me out into that storm. I was mad at you at the time, but it really meant a lot to me, um, after my last expedition. Zoe paused and swallowed. After my last expedition, she said again. I swore I would never do another expedition. I didn't just lose my arm, I lost her. Uh, well, anyway, I swore I'd never do it again, but I couldn't afford the nanites that would help regrow my arm. The medic seemed to think that the prosthetic was good enough. Zoe looked down at her right arm with a grimace. But all it does, every day, is remind me of what happened. I can't get past it. I can't get over it. Because the damn thing is here is reminding me. And it doesn't matter if it's better than my old arm. It reminds me that I wasn't good enough to save everyone that needed saving. I signed up for one last expedition. And I met you and the Rifts and Nate and Annan. Zoe shook her head and gave a little bit of laugh. The irony is that my last expedition, the leader really played up the whole humans are so badass thing. That's what ended up getting us in trouble. And then I joined this expedition and it's the same thing all over again. Nate talks about it all the time and you hired us because our special skill was being human. Zoe sighed. But you know what? I think everything will turn out okay, whether or not humans are badasses of the galaxy. End of chapter. Part 15 When every human tells you a story, the first thing you must determine is if the story is a real event, witnessed by the human. A so-called real event witnessed by a friend of a relation of a human or a fictional event designed to be shared for religious or social purposes. Do not offend the human when trying to determine into which category the story falls. Sometimes this can be tricky. Do be a review of ontological species studies, the care and feeding of humans, news, stories, and tales, published by Glass and Steel, the care and feeding of humans. Translation Engine 3.14159 The storm raged for hours. Bubsy was startled at a near lightning strike, but other than that, she didn't seem to care about the storm at all. Zoe's pick of camping spots howled out. A nearby tree was struck, but the tent wasn't. 
A branch was blown against the tent, but was repelled by the force field. As the night continued and the storm didn't let up, the noise was too much to consider sleeping. They can frigging build a force field that doesn't let in rain or wind, but it has to let in sound, Nate groused. Well, um, blocking out sounds wouldn't be the best safety feature, Alan pointed out reasonably. We could set it to ignore storms, Nate muttered. If you wanted it the easy way, Alan said, the ship could have bombed the heck out of the forest creating a landing spot right near the ground station so that we didn't have to hike all the way in. That wouldn't be quite a good business practice, Querif said, a little shocked. Nerf could see that Nate was about to say something when Zoe interrupted. How about we tell stories, since we can't sleep, she suggested. What uh, kind of stories, Nerf asked. What's the funniest or the strangest thing that has ever happened to you on an expedition? Alan suggested. Zoe opened her mouth, looked like she wanted to object, and then closed it again. No, oh, I have one, Tariff said. Tariff has the floor. Tariff sat up straight and said, Okay, this happened about three expeditions back. The flyby and the initial expedition had already been done. The planet was rated a solid one. We were on a secondary expedition, and we landed, and it was awesome! He turned to Nerif and Querif. Remember how awesome that place was? Nerif smiled and nodded and Querif laughed. Oh, <laughs> I remember, he said. Nerif took up the story again. It was rated a one for biological hazards, so we were on the lookout for monsters of one kind or another. But it was just an awesome place. It had the best places for swimming and the shores were soft. The wind was only a soft tickle and it smelled... He paused and inhaled, as though smelling the planet all over again, and smiled. Wonderful! And I found some new spices, and they were just awesome for cooking. Zoe smothered a smile at Terra's joy of all things, both awesome and cooking. So one night after dinner, and a really nice swim in the moonlight, we'd all settled down to sleep. And we heard a noise. Terra paused for effect, and the storm obliged him with a flash of lightning, and almost instant crescendo of thunder. Okay, not a loud noise, Tariff corrected the storm. A harsh, whispering noise. A noise like the bones of a skeleton rubbing together. He turned and looked at each person individually. Since the plants had been so peaceful, the sound caused some alarm. We looked over the dew where the sound was coming from, and appearing over the edge was a huge spider. Alan picked up the sleeping Fubsby and held her in his lap, petting her while Tariff told his story. I'm not talking big, like a dinner plate side. I'm talking huge. This thing was at least three meters tall, and it scuttled. It scuttled over the top of the dune towards us, and behind it would do more. Tariff paused and took a sip of his hot chocolate. I have to tell you, we were freaking out. I have never before had doubt in the strength of a force field, but when those three things were coming at us, I could only pray to the Ocean Mother that they were old. People were running around, and we wanted yelling. Some people grabbed weapons, even though weapons fired from inside the tent would never penetrate the force field. I wondered if I should run away, out of the tent, or count on it holding. I couldn't even see Nareth or Quareth. We glanced at them and said, I am... Um, so scared. Even more than spiders, I think, uh, was not knowing me you were. The spiders got closer, and just as they got to the edge of the false field, they disappeared. Shoot anyway, advised Alan, just in case they're still there and invisible. Bubsby woke up and a little and chowed on Alan's thumb before going back to sleep. Tariff nodded. That was what I was thinking. One of the guys, a big troll, he had his weapon out and ready to shoot if the spiders broke through. He said the spiders hadn't left the tracks in the sand. Shoot, anyway, Alan said again. Well, it started a little argument. Then someone pulled out their camp pad and did a scan on the nearest person. It turns out, Tara said, and smiled a tiny bit, that one of the spices I'd used during the dinner was a hallucinogen. He paused and sighed. Yeah, that was awkward. Nuke it from space, Alan muttered. It's the only way to be sure. Wait, so he said. How did you all have the same hallucination? Terra shrugged. A military team was called in, and the two big theories were either that we all had seen a small spider, 
and then used that as a basis for seeing the huge ones. Although one person was having a spider hallucination, and the spices made us psychic with each other. The military never told us the real answer was. And they confiscated all my spices, he added in an injured tone. They all laughed at that. Of all the things he was upset about, it was perfect that Tara was most upset about the fact that his spices had been taken away. The laughter woke Fuzzby up for real. She jumped off Alan's lap. She stalked determinedly towards Nerif and crawled up on her lap. Nerif looked down at the kitten, who was settling down and closed her eyes to show that she was sleeping now, and not to be disturbed again. What do I do? Nerif asked. Whatever you want, Zoe said. Better, or ignore her, or pick her up and dump her off your lap. Nerif waved her hands at the kitten. Move, move, Fumsby, move! Fumsby closed her eyes tighter, settled down flatter, and just barely extended her claws into Nerif's clothes, just far enough that Nerif could feel the tiny claws. Something touched Nerif's heart then, and she stopped trying to shoo Fumsby off her lap. I'll take her, Nate said. No, it's okay, Nerif said. She's, um, fine. She put on her hand and gently stroked Fubsby's fur. She was soft and warm, and while Nerif panted her, the stripes of dark fur grew a little broader. Nerif looked up at Zoe. What does that mean? Zoe shrugged. I have no idea. Nate looked sharply at Fubsby. That, he said, that is the weirdest thing that I have ever seen on an expedition. He pulled out his combat and scanned Fubsby. Nothing beeped, and Nate put his compad away with a shrug. Maybe it's a protective coloration for the night, and because she's a kitten, she doesn't do it well yet. Or maybe her markings are heat-sensitive. Nerif bent down and whispered to Bumsby, Who's a good girl? Yes, who's a good girl? End of chapter. Part 16 Humans Find Trouble some experts feel that humans are trouble, but a statistical analysis reveals that, in actual fact, humans find trouble. This has been largely determined to be linked to their high level of curiosity. If anything strange appears in their environment, humans will initially regard it with suspicion, as all seeing beings would. However, they move past the suspicion phase into the curiosity phase extremely quickly. While other species take, on average, 400 exposures to a strange stimulus before engaging in exploration, humans as a whole move from suspicion to curiosity after less than an average of 10 exposures. The speed of the conversion is faster when humans are younger, implying that experience does have some effect on their basic trait. There is no explanation for why humans feel that curiosity is highly dangerous to the feline species of their world. Dubuque, Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Curiosity Killed the Cat, published by Gloss and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. Eventually, despite the noise of the storm, people were able to get to sleep. What ships were still kept, in case the storm damaged the outer tents. By virtue of the fact that Fuzzy was on narrow slap and she didn't want to disturb the kitten, Zoe and Nerif took first watch. Nerif was fascinated with the little pink pads in Pubsby's feet. They are called beans, Zoe said. Why? I guess because they are shaped like a vegetable we have back home, Zoe said. She wasn't watching Nerif or Pubsby, but instead kept watching the stormy night. What the? Zoe stood up and walked to the edge of the tent, and Nerif looked up to see what had caught Zoe's attention. Off the distance, though not too far away, a light was moving back and forth, as though someone were waving a portable light. Nerif quickly checked to make sure that everyone was still present in the tent. What is that? Nerif asked. Probably not something good, Zoe said. It could be a natural effect of the storm, a type of ball lightning, for example. There are creatures on Earth that create lures with light, so it could be something like that is looking for a meal. It's in the general direction of the ground station, but I really hope it's just a coincidence, Zoe said. Any special reason why? Nerif asked. Zoe sighed. Since the storms have hit, I haven't been able to raise the ship at all. I've sent out daily mission reports, but I'm not getting any confirmation that they've been received. Our last voice transmission with them was the first day, before the storm hit. 
and it was laced with interference. The ground station is supposed to act as a relay, bouncing our messages to the ship. But other than the beacon showing where the ground station is located, I haven't been able to sync up with the ground station at all. That's not really concerning, since our primary mission is to replace and upgrade the battery for the station. But Zoe looked at the light again, still gently waving back and forth. That light isn't being waved around by the wind from the storm, Nareth observed. No, Zoe agreed, it's not. Something else is waving it, or causing it to move. But we're not going to go chasing after it in the dark, either. Bubsby got up, stretched, and washed herself. That's our cue to wake up the next shift, Zoe said. Nero woke up Tariff, who sat up suddenly and said, But is it morning? Nero ruffled his feathers. No, Zoe, it's your shift. Oh, right. Tariff scrubbed his face with his hands. I I'm awake. I got this. Good, Nero said, because it looks like you and Nate are going to have some fun. Nero pointed to the light. What is that? Tariff said. No idea. Probably something dangerous. Keep an eye on it and wake us if it gets any closer, Zoe said. Nate was stretching and yawning behind her, and then tucked his shirt in and finger combed his hair. No problem. Oh, Nara said to Tariff, I think Fubsby needs feeding too. She glanced away from the light to see Tariff holding the kitten. She had both front paws on his thumb and was determinedly chewing on him, but unable to puncture his skin with her teeth. Yeah, I got that, Tariff said with a smile. Nate, you, you hold her a minute. I'll whip something up. Sure, Nate said, reaching for the kitten. Whip something up for me too, would you? Not carnivore infant Formula 1, more like omnivore adult Formula 3. Tariff snickered as he passed the kitten over. No problem, omnivore. Bobsby settled into Nate's arms and started kneading his shirt with her paws. Ouch, cat, Nate said. There's an arm under there. Bubsby paused at Nate's tone, and he immediately apologized. It's all right, I'm a big tough human, I can take it. Go ahead, Fuzzball. Bubsby resumed the kneading, presumably because Nate's tone of voice had been the tone of voice that usually meant food or for pets were coming soon. In the morning, Quareff and Alan woke everyone up. At least, Nareff assumed it was morning. The sky was still dark, and the storm still pounded against the 10th force field. She glanced over at the light, and it was still waving gently in the dark. Alan saw her glance and shook his head. It hasn't done anything all night, except wave back and forth. Quareff, now one holding Pubsby, he was feeding her snippets of food and scritching her under her chin, which she seemed to enjoy immensely. As they were eating breakfast, Zoe said, I think I have an idea about how to handle the storm, but I need everyone's agreement and a volunteer to test it on. We can't wait around for the storm to stop. We have to get to the ground station. The rifts can't walk through the storm. We can't split up the party. Everyone agreed with Zoe's assessment of the situation. It's curled stuck between a rock and a hard place, Nate said. Though with the storm, maybe we should say stuck between lightning and thunder. The lightning strike a few trees away seemed to approve of Nate's comment, and he looked a little startled. I think we can make it to the ground station this morning, Zoe said but we'll need umbrellas. Quareff glanced in Nerev's direction and she shrugged. She had no idea what Zoe was talking about. But Zoe, Alan said, we didn't pack umbrellas, and even if we did, they would never hold up to the storm. Zoe nodded and smiled. I think we have umbrellas, she said. Look. Zoe picked up two nodes from the interior tent. This caused the interior tent to fail. But with Zoe holding two nodes, one in each hand, she became the new center of the tent. I think if the rifts carry two nodes, they'll basically have portable tent with them, and this will let us make it to the ground station this morning. Zoe looked at everyone, hope and doubt in her face. What do you think? Rifts, are you willing to try it? I think, Quirf said, that is the most brilliant idea I've ever heard of in my life. I'll be happy to test it. Zoe handed him the notes, and Quirif took a deep breath and headed out of the perimeter of the tent. As he walked past the first set of nodes, the two nodes linked up with the existing notes and fled back into the interior tent, and then died out when he walked down to the linking distance. The same flare happened as he walked through the outer ring of nodes, but when he walked further out, his nodes stayed active to each other, 
and the outer tent's nodes just relinked with the existing nodes. He stood outside the tent, a node in each hand, and turned slowly, and then walked back through the tent perimeters. It was dry, except for where his feet had walked on the wet ground. I think it works, he said with a smile. Everyone packed up quickly, and the nodes from the interior tent were distributed to each person. It was agreed that the rifts had use of them, but that the humans would only use them while it was convenient, dropping them if they needed to pull their weapons. Bobsby was put back in a sling and given to Nareth to carry. Before the nodes for the outer tent were taken down, the remaining droid was given two nodes as well, front and back. I don't know if this will help or not, so he said, but it would be nice to not lose our final droid on the last leg of the journey. Once the rifts, Bobsby and the droids were prepared, the humans picked up the nodes from the outer ring. The wind and the rain struck hard, because they had to load up the remaining loads, and couldn't have two free hands holding the nodes to protect themselves during the final packing. Once the last of the nodes were packed though, everyone had two nodes, one in each hand. The last droid was steadily moving towards the moving light, and the expedition party, plus Kitten, moved along after it. Waving lights disappeared as they moved closer to it, which was a relief. However, when they arrived at the ground station, no one said a word. The station was badly damaged, and none of the sensors seemed to be working at all. Nerev couldn't tell if the damage had been done by a storm, or if it had suffered the same attacks as the droids. Well, Zoe said, looking at the mess, at least we know why I couldn't sync up at the station. End of chapter. Part 17 when it comes to the science of linguistics, a wealth of information about humans can be gleaned from this simple fact. The various species of the aggregate have, on average, seven words for trouble. The glint have ten, but six of those words were added after encountering humans. Humans, however, have over 407,631 words for trouble. Dubyuk Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Trouble right here. Published by Glass and Steel, The Karen Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. That is pretty impressive, Nate said. The humans had set up a barometer around the ground station, and Nerif was able to finally set down her nodes. She rubbed her arms while looking at the mess. The ground station was shaped round like a powwow shao. But in this case, the hole in the middle has been filled with equipment and the power source. The ring around it would be where the crew and the access information collected by the station. Or normally, it would have been. There were two doors in the outer ring, on opposite sides. Both doors had been damaged. One door was missing while the other door was bent, but still attached to the station. The interior of the station was dark. When normal protocol would dictate that the automatic lights would come on whenever he was sensed movement. She couldn't begin to tell how much damage had been done to the equipment itself, given that there were no indicator lights of any kind. Nerif guessed that it was a lot of damage. Qualen and Quirif were already scouting through the wreckage. Quirif had his back under the one of the desks and Alan flipping switches an important looking machine. Nate and Zoe were setting up doors. Tara was feeding Fubsby and trying to distract her from climbing in, on, over, or through the debris and Quarif's legs. Nareth felt helpless. She didn't have knowledge to help repair the equipment. Fubsby really only needed one distraction person, and she wasn't strong enough to help Nate and Zoe with the door repair. Alan swore over something that he'd found, and Nareth headed over. Is there anything I can do to help? I feel useless, Nareff said. Actually, yeah, Alan said. Would you mind holding the light here so that I can see what these wires should have been attached to? He handed her a portable light and indicated a spot where the light should shine. Nareff held the light and Alan swore again. It looks like some sort of animal has been at the wires. I'll have to do some stripping and trimming, but I think we can get some things going again. Quirrell's voice from under the desk near the center of the power shell said, no, oh, um, don't count to that. He slid out and held up his fingers to show some liquid and grit on them. 
It looks like the batteries are fried along with some of the wiring. I'm not sure how much we can be repaired. Darrow's stomach did a flip. That means we can't talk to the ship, right? Her voice was surprisingly calm. She wasn't going to upset the nesters, so she would remain calm. Quero brushed his hands off his pants. Well, not from here. Not today. We'll probably have to go back to the shuttle and contact them. The sound of the storm dropped noticeably, and Nerev looked at the door. Nate and Zoe evidently had jury-rigged something to make the door work. Jury-rigged. Sounded like that illegal thing that might happen when the Earth judiciary system. But Nate had explained recently that jury-rigged was a nautical term. Nerev suspected that if Nate couldn't be a space cowboy, he would want to be a space sailor or a pirate. Nate and Zoe were heading over to where Alan and Quarif were still poking at the equipment bits. It looks like one door was destroyed by an animal, Zoe said, as she stepped around the droid. It was scuttling about, moving debris into piles. Organic in one pile, possibly salvageable equipment into another pile. The second door looks like it was damaged by wind or the interior side, so I'm guessing that it happened second. Animal breaks in, storm wrecks second door, Nate said. But the damage looks months old, so why didn't the sensors indicate a storm months ago? Quero smiled. Oh, I can answer that one. Based on what I could find on the records, a mendactic storm hit and damaged the operating system about nine months ago. That caused a cascade of errors. First, this station has been dutifully sending the day's data burst every day. The first day's data, over and over and over, which is why there haven't been any records of storms. Nate groaned. I know better than to trust technology. Quarif nodded. Second, the strike caused a power failure in the primary battery that allowed the animal to break in. Even if there were enough power to send an alarm, it wasn't going anywhere. The battery was probably further drained by repeated attempts to send the alarm. The animal or animals played Mary Hob with the electronics, and we now have a ground station that's... He gestured at the damage. Zoe's lips twitched. Mary Hob. Quarif waved his hands. Whatever. Lots of damage, havoc, dogs of war, whatever you want to call it, we've got it. Nerev sighed. Is it irreparable, or do we have to order a replacement? Because it won't be good business to move forward with the expedition if we have to order a replacement. Quarif looked at Alan. What do you think? Alan looked at the spaghetti of wires. Give us a day, then we'll know more. Nerev nodded. She headed over to Tariff, who hadn't been part of the conversation. He was now trying to distract Bubsby from bothering the droid. Tariff looked up. I heard. Not much for two of us to do, right? Tariff nodded. Unless somebody needs me to hold a light again. She looked at Bubsby, a smile on her face and leaned forward. It was hard to tell in the dark station, but... Is it me or is Bubsby a solid dark grey now? Tariff nodded. I know. We're right. So I'm thinking it's either based on her being warmer now, or that she's better fed now. When we first had her, she was really hungry. If you have several young and your lightest colored ones are the hungriest, it's easier to divide the food. Just guess. But I think that's what it is. It sounds good, Tariff said. Fits all the facts and has a plausible explanation. The only problem is... She stopped and looked at Tariff with a smile. He smiled back. Yeah, we'll never be able to test it. Tariff laughed. Because you'll never let her get that hungry again. Just then, the lights flickered and came on. You fixed the lights, Tariff said. Not really, Adam admitted. We just powered them directly into the battery that we brought to replenish the power for the station. But light will help us figure out if we can fix anything. And the storm is breaking, I observed Zoe, looking out the window. Nerf looked too, and saw the purple rolling clouds moving away from their location. But, um, for how long? Nerf asked. If someone wants to try and check the records tonight while Alan and I are working on repairs, that would be fine. I might give some insight into the storm patterns, Quarif said. I'll see what I can find, Nerf said. It will give me something to do. As the true dark of evening approached, Nerev saw the waving light again through the window. Zoe, the light's back. Zoe walked over to the window. Hmm. 
If the weather holds tomorrow, I think we should probably check that out. Zoe stepped outside onto the ground station and the tent and loaded her weapon with something, before taking careful aim and firing it towards the light. The light didn't seem to respond in any way. What did you do? Narif asked. I fired a transponder as close to that thing as I could, so that we can find it tomorrow. We'll go on a little trip while Querif and Alan work on the station. Maybe collect some samples. So either way, the trip won't be a complete waste. Zoe and Narif watched the light a while longer. It was almost hypnotic in the way it moved, and then suddenly flailed around wildly and then went out. Oh, Narif said and turned to look at Zoe. Did it get eaten? Or was it doing the eating? Zoe pointed out the window again, and the light was back waving back and forth like seaweed in gentle waves. End of chapter Part 18 It's easy to make the mistake that a herbivores are gentle and peaceful, and that carnivores are dangerous and quick, but creating those images in your mind is a dangerous game of self-delusion. It denies the fierce intensity of the shower people, vegetarians all, or the mindful meditations of the bounty people, who live in a strict diet of meat and whose entire religion is devoted to honoring the lives that they take for food. And it will leave you totally unprepared for the enigma that is a human. Do be a review of ontological species, the care and feeding of humans. You are what you eat, published by Glass and Steel. Translation Engine 3.14159 Looking out the window at the light, Nerif reached out and touched the glass. She felt something brush against her leg and looked down to see Fubsby sniffling her pants. Then Fubsby stood up on her hind paws and reached up to Nerif, before sinking her claws in and trying to climb Nerif's leg. Ow! What are you doing? Nerif cried. Zoe bent over and pulled Fubsby loose from Nerif's leg. I think she wants you to hold her, Zoe said. Well, she could ask, Nerif said, but reached out for the kitten. That hurt? Bubsby, you can't climb my leg like that. Nerif, you do know that she doesn't understand you, right? Zoe said. Nerif blushed, the faint purple hard to see in the makeshift light system that Alan and Quirif had set up. I know, but you all talk to her like she can understand, Nerif said. Zoe smiled. That's a human thing. We talk to everything, even inanimate objects. Narif nodded. That's what the book said. Zoe looked at Narif, a small smile, but a very firm eyebrows. I keep hearing people talk about the book. You really need to let me read it. When we get back on the ship, Narif promised, I will get you the location. Bubsby seemed content now that Narif was holding her and tried to turn over on her back in Narif's hands, her head upside down and her bed exposed. Nerf made a little sound. No ocean below. She's the most adorable thing that I've ever seen. Zoe smiled. You're on your way to becoming a crazy cat lady. We'll know you've arrived once you start dressing her up in clothes. Nerf looked puzzled. What is a crazy cat lady? And why would I want to be one? And why would anyone, no matter how crazy, dress up a cat in... The tent surrounding the ground station flashed a brilliant light show of red and gold and Nerif almost dropped Fubsby. Zoe cursed and ran to the door, Nate a little behind her. When Zoe got to the door, she used the door scanner for a moment, unholstered her weapon, and opened up the door. She swore again and turned back to the team and yelled, Kill the lights! Alan yanked the wires that connected the lights to the battery pack, and darkness dropped around them. Alan, you and the rips wait here. Guard the door. Nate, you're with me. Zoe said. Nate pulled his weapon and followed Zoe out the door, closing it behind them. Alan walked over to the door and stood next to it, his back to the wall. Nerif saw that he pulled his weapon too. Quirif, you hold bumps me, Nerif said. Tariff, pull your knife. Why me? Quirif said. Because Tariff is better with his knife than you are, Nerif said. Again, her voice was calm, matter of fact. Only because he's a chef and spends more time cutting things up, Quarif muttered, but not too loudly. He took Fubsby, but must not have been ungentle because, Ow! Fubsby bit me! Treat her better next time, Tariff advised. 
Well, Bobsby, I didn't mean to scare you, Gareth murmured to the kitten. Bobsby made a little bleat of a sound back. Nerf's attention was on the windows. She saw first Zoe's shadow and then Nate's cross in front of the windows. They walked around the station. In the space between the station and the tent, Nerf followed them from one block of windows to the next. They stopped at one point and Zoe crouched out and then Nate joined her. But Nerf couldn't see what they were doing without getting closer to the windows and she wasn't ready to do that. After a few minutes, Zoe and Nate came back in again. Looks like something was running through the forest and hit the false field in the dark. It stunned itself, Zoe announced. We tried getting some low-line pictures of it, but I didn't want to cross the false field when we don't know what's going on yet. If it's still there in the morning, we'll see what more we can discover about it. How would it hit our false field? Quarif asked. They shrugged. Basically, the false field just looks like a black spot. It's easy to miss a black spot in the dark. And if you're running through, wham! It looks like some sort of undulate. I mean, uh, I know alien world and all, but it does look like it's an herbivorous mammal thingy. Are we okay to put the lights back on? Alan asked. Sure, so he said. It's not like they're going to attract any attention. I just needed them out so that I could see outside better. Nerif had forgotten for a moment how well humans could see in the dark. Nate said, hold on one minute, I just want to see if I can get a good look at that thing. He walked over to the end of the banks of windows to try and see the creature. Nope, I guess we could send a droid out to keep an eye on it. Zoe wrinkled her nose. I don't want to send our last droid out, not as long as the perimeter is holding. But I get what you mean. She turned to Querif. Any chance that you could at least get the ground station surveillance working? Quirf shrugged. It hasn't highest on my list of priorities, but I could take a look at it and see if we can get at least one of them running. He set Fubsby down, who cried her protest to Quirf and anyone that would listen. He ignored her, after giving her a little pet, and then he and Alan moved over to see if the security cameras could be hooked up into the battery directly, like the lights, which Alan plugged back in. Once the lights came back up, Nerif glanced out the windows. With lights on its side and dark outside, she didn't expect to see anything, and she was right. She got closer to the glass and frowned. Huh, she said. The glowing light is gone again. Do you think our undulate scared it? Given the speed that the thing must have been using to knock itself unconscious, it's probably more likely that it was scared by something else. But that's just a guess, Nate said. They settled on their standard watch list again, where if an Alan were able to set up some of the security cameras. It's a crap job, Alan said. We can't get the IR to work at all, and some of the cameras seem to have a weird hiccup, but, um, it's great, interrupted Zoe, and more than what we had. The night was quiet. No thumps, no storms, and Nero found herself nodding a little, not falling asleep, but maybe drifting in that direction. Then, Fubsby hissed. End of chapter. Part 9 It is the human ability to sweat that gives them their well-deserved reputation as persistence hunters and pursuit predators. While predators generally fall into pursuit or ambush categories, the ability to follow prey for long distances is a definition of persistence hunters. Humans follow their prey until it gives up. Most beings pant to relieve excess heat, which means holding still long enough for that to work. Humans cool down with an endothermic reaction caused by sweat evaporating from their skin. This allows them to follow their prey until it gives up due to exhaustion. Like some nightmare, humans just keep going and going. Dubiuk of the Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Persistence Hunting and Sweat, published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. At Pubsy's hiss, Zoe was on her feet, weapon drawn. Nerif, turn off the lights, she ordered in a quiet voice, and Nerif scrambled towards the battery to shut off the lights. Alan and Nate were up by the time that Nerif had turned off the lights, even though Zoe had been quiet. She evidently wasn't quiet enough to avoid human detection. What is it, Fubsy? Zoe asked. 
Bubsy hissed again, turning her body slightly as whatever it was that was outside was obviously moving. Zoe slid over to one of the windows. A shadow of darkness, a faint glow from the outside was the only reason Nareth could see Zoe at all. Nate, Alan, are you seeing this? Zoe asked. Nothing on my end, Nate said. I don't see any weight. It's uh, just moving into my view. It looks like it's dragging Nate's antelope deeper into the woods, Alan said. I can't make out what it is, though. Zoe, you got any guesses? I can't even tell the damn thing's got feathers or fur, Zoe said. Nate, can you see it yet? And then, in a disbelieving voice, Is, um, your antelope glowing? Nate shifted to another window for a better vantage point. Yeah, it looks like it, uh, parts of it anyway. Can you see any better of what's dragging it off? So he asked. Nate shook his head. No. I can think of a number of predators that drag their food off to save for later, or eat when no one else is around, Tariff chimed in. They're all on Earth, though, but they do exist. Sorry to wake you, Tariff, so he said. It wasn't you, Tariff said. It was Fubsy's hiss. No way I could sleep through that, Tariff said. I didn't even try, Quarif said. Well, Nareth thought, Bubsy seems to be a better alarm than the station's surveillance if it can wake Quirif up. But she didn't say anything. Nothing is gone now, so he said. But she looked at Bubsy before reholstering her weapon. Bubsy was busy washing herself and didn't seem worried at all. Morning started lighting the world without another incident. Quarif and Alan grabbed their breakfasts and started working on their evaluation of the ground station repairs. After everyone was done eating, including Fubsy, who asked for and received two breakfasts, Zoe stood up. I'm going to go looking for that transponder today, and also see if I can find out anything about our midnight visitor. Any of you three up for coming with me? she asked. Everyone seemed excited to go, and Tariff picked up Fubsy and said, Four of us, not three. Tariff, Zoe said, that isn't a field trip in someone's backyard. This is a primary expedition on a world that was incorrectly classified as a two or a three. But Bubsy helped us last night, Tariff protested. She might be able to warn us again. Zoe opened her mouth and then closed it again, her fingers tapping the butt of a holstered weapon. I agree that Bubsy might be useful. However, I don't want to be responsible for her death if we run into something. Bubsy stays, Zoe said. Zoe was the first one to exit the ground station, with Nerif and Tariff behind, and Nate bringing up the rear. The space between the ground station and the force field wasn't as narrow as it had seemed to Nerif last night. Zoe headed toward the animal head bin, and then crouched down to get a closer look at the ground. See here, she pointed at a dark spot on the ground. When Nate's antelope knocked itself out, it was bleeding a little bit here. That might have attracted the attention of the predator or a scavenger. What's the difference? Nareth asked. The predator kills its food, a scavenger eats something that's already dead. Either another animal's kill, or if it died from natural causes, Zoe explained. Nareth felt a little sick. You have so many dead bodies in your world that you have an ecosystem built on creatures that live off of dead bodies. Zoe looked at her and gave a faint smile. You have it on your world too, only because it's in the water. It's mostly bacteria, but it's an ecosystem built on disposing dead bodies. We're not so different, Arif. It's just a matter of scale. Like the difference between lightning and a lightning bug, Tariff quipped. Nate laughed. You guys quote Twain? Tariff shrugged. There is a kind of fad about quoting Earth writers. It's cool that a world so scary and deadly can create people that love beautiful things. However, Tara frowned at Nerev. Some people tell us that we get the context wrong. Anyway, so he interrupted, to get back to Nate's antelope. It's not my antelope, Nate said under his breath. You can see more blood here. Zoe pointed to another spot on the ground. We didn't see that last night, though it's possible we missed it. Then over here, Zoe pointed further out at a smooth area on the ground. You can see where it was dragged by whatever. Too bad dragging it away wiped out its tracks. I'd love to have some idea of what it was. Nate was checking his compad while Zoe had been talking. Well, looky at what we have here, he said. 
Are the night visitors dragging his dinner in the same direction as your transponder signal from last night, Zoe? What are the odds? Zoe stood up, dusting her hands. You know what they say about coincidence, right? What do they say about coincidence? Tariff whispered to Nerf. She could only shrug. There is no such thing as, Zoe said, who had obviously heard Tariff's whisper. I want everyone to stay away from these drag marks, Zoe said. At least one meter, so that we don't get confused with the trail or our own prints. Everyone got it. Nerf and Tariff nodded empathically while Nate rolled his eyes. But Nerf noticed that once they stepped out of the safety of the false field, he complied with Zoe's directions. Zoe followed the trail left in the dirt, while Nate called out the trail on the compad for the transponder. Once they were under the shelter of trees, it seemed pretty clear that the two were heading in the same direction. Nerf and Terif scanned the trees with their compads as they walked, just in case. It started getting warmer, or maybe just moving around made it feel warmer. Zoe and Nate weren't panting at all, but Zoe did wipe sweat off of her face with the back of her hand. Nate did as well, though he used his whole arm. Tariff and Nerif were both panting to cool down. Zoe noticed and called a halt for a rest. Nerif gratefully sat down on the ground, leaning against the tree. Tariff grabbed another tree and Nate sat down next to Tariff. They were discussing something to do with cooking, and Nerif tuned them out and turned to Zoe, who was sitting under the tree as well. Zoe, um... Do you remember that first day we met? Nerif asked. Zoe looked at her with a puzzled smile. Of course I do. I want to apologize for anything I might have said that upset you that day, Nerif said. Zoe shook her head. You didn't say anything to upset me. You mean about my arm? It's my arm that upsets me, not you or anyone else mentioning it. Nerif nodded. Thank you. But, um, I meant later, in your quarters... I said something about getting you a reading light because your catalog said that you liked reading, and your eyes started sweating, and you put your jacket away, and you were okay, Nerif said. Zoe nodded slowly. I remember. But you weren't sweating, were you? Nerif asked. No, Zoe said slowly. I wasn't sweating. Because when humans sweat, you do it all over. You were crying, weren't you? Nerif pressed. Zoe tilted her head back with a sigh. Don't read anything into it, Nerif. Sometimes humans should just cry. We're crying from relief and from finding something that speaks to us, just as much as we cry from pain. Where are you crying from relief? Nerif asked. It had been playing on her mind ever since she'd read Rurul's file about Zoe. Zoe laughed a little. I guess I was. Usually, when I'm on an expedition, no one ever looks out for me. As the humans, we are the, um... Zoe made angry fingered gestures in the air. Bad has humans capable of blah blah blah. I hate it. It's almost gotten me killed. Bit stupid. It marks us as different from all the other people on the aggregate. Keeps us separate. Zoe leaned her head forward into her knees and looked down at the dirt. It's um, not even all that true, she muttered. What does this mean? Nera asked and made an angry finger after Joey looked up again. You've done it before and it just reminds me of when Grilla Crab is going to strike for its meal. Zoe laughed. It's not like that. It's just two fingers like this. Zoe made the gesture again. It's air quotes. It usually means, Zoe paused, trying to find the right words. I guess it usually means you don't believe what you're saying. It's a kind of sarcasm. Zoe stood up and dusted dirt off her pants. Everyone ready to push on? As everyone stood up, Nerif touched Zoe's arm. I'm glad you're with us, so that we can watch your back when you are watching ours. End of chapter. Part 20 Humans have the largest capacity for denial of any species in the aggregate. Given overwhelming evidence that they will still deny the truth that is plain for everyone else to see. It is tempting to write this off as just another quirk about humans that makes no sense or seems to have no positive outcome on survival. For example, how does it serve survival to deny that you are building your house on an active volcano? Further, how does it serve survival to deny that the volcano will erupt? 
The theory has been put forward that the denial is linked to something that the humans call hope. Having hope, they say, gives them the world to continue in the face of overwhelming odds. To be a review of ontological species studies, the Garen feeding of humans, denial is not just a river on earth. Published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. They continued on, Zoe ahead of the others, what Nate had called on point. Nerif was beginning to wonder how they could see the light if their source was that far away, when Zoe held up her hand, motioning them to stop. Zoe slipped back to where they were standing and said in a low voice, I'm not sure what happened, but it looks like there might have been a dinner dispute. Step lightly. I'm looking at you, Nate, she said. Nate faked an injured appearance. Me? How have you know that I am the soul of lightness, renowned for my dancing in several systems? Troll star systems, maybe. Zoe shot back quietly, but with a grin. I think we can get a better view this way. Nerif and the others followed Zoe around some undergrowth and came to a small clearing. However, the dirt seemed wrong. There is the transponder, and over there is Nate's antelope, Zoe said in a whisper, and the tracks just stopped, like whatever had been dragging the antelope disappeared or flew away. But if it could fly away, why drag the thing this far? Or why not eat it and then leave? Why expend the energy to drag it and then stop? And what is on the antelope, Dareth said. This time her voice was not calm. She was pretty sure she sounded like she felt sick. I think those are glowworms, so he breathed, which would explain why Nate's antelope wasn't glowing when we first saw it, but was glowing when the thing dragged it away. It's not my antelope, Nate hissed. Well, it does look like an antelope, Nareff observed in a soft voice, trying to distract herself. Except for that bony plate it has on its nose, and the worms. Nera felt his skin bridge up in distaste. So, dead animal starts glowing, scavenger retrieves it, drags it to a place where we've seen glowing lights, Zoe observed. Droids get attacked, shiny droids get attacked, Nate corrected himself. Maybe it's the light. Seems reasonable, Zoe said. By which you mean you've heard of it on Earth, Tariff put in. Zoe smiled. Yeah, exactly. But where's the thing that made the glowing lights? Why hasn't it eaten the glowing antelope if it's attracted to all things glowing? Nara asked. Zoe picked up a rock off the ground and bounced it experimentally a couple times in her hand. Then she leaned back and tossed it to the center of the clearing. No monster emerged from the dirt to grab it, which is what Nara had been expecting. Zoe too, by the way she made a huh noise. And then the rock, which had been sitting on the dirt, started to sink. In a few seconds, it had sunk into the dirt, with no ripple and not even a mound to show that it had ever been there. Zoe motioned for everyone to back away from the edge of the clearing, and they started back to the ground station. Okay, Terra finally said. Make note, don't step on funny-looking dirt. And, um, maybe no more traveling in the dark, Zoe added. If we'd gone looking for that light the first night, we might have stepped into that quagmire before we even knew what had happened. Quagmire? Nerif asked, tipping her head. Dirt that sucks you in, Zoe explained. Like quicksand. I remember you talking about quicksand on the ship. Did you know that this would be here? Humans are psychic, Nerif said in a shocked surprise. We did talk about it on the ship, Zoe agreed. But humans aren't psychic. Nate opened his mouth to say something and Zoe elbowed him in the ribs with the right arm. I've never heard of quicksand before in my life. And now it turns up on the very planet we're contracted for. How is that not psychic? Nerif asked. It's just the bond on main half phenomenon, Zoe said. That sounds like a really terrible disease, Tariff snickered. It's just a thing, Zoe waved her hand. You know, you learn a new word and then you start hearing it all over the place. It just means that now that you know about the new thing, you're hyper aware of it. Anyway, humans are not psychic. Please don't add that to the list of strange things about humans, Zoe said. Nerif recognized the painful subject for Zoe and didn't bring it up again. But whether Zoe liked it or not, there was already a debate about humans and their luck, as well as their ability to anticipate actions 
or what someone might say. Nerf shot a warning look at Teref, but he wasn't looking at her. What about this theory? Teref asked. Creature drags Nate's dead antelope towards light, gets caught in quagmire and is eaten. Thing is now sleepy and hasn't eaten Nate's antelope yet, but will when it wakes up. Zoe nodded. You've been reading about trapped all spiders, haven't you? Teref blushed, a light wash of purple. Yeah. If it's like a trapped all spider, we should be glad we're alive. If it's asleep, that explains why it didn't respond to the vibrations of our footsteps. If the ground station is repairable, and we end up staying for a few more days, we may have to come back out and study this, so he said. A thoughtful note in her voice. From a safe distance, Nerf added. Of course, so he said, and smiled a little wickedly. Back at the ground station, Nerf sat down gratefully. Quirif and Alan were still going over the electronics, though didn't have any results that they wanted to share yet. Nerf started reviewing the storm data on a compad to get some idea of what the weather was really like. Bubsy climbed onto her lap and slowly made her way in between Nerf and her compad. Bubsy! You're making it hard for me to do my job, Nerf told her. Fubsy closed its eyes and stretched a paw over to the combat screen. That's not helping, Fubsy, Nerf said. She slid the combat out from underneath Fubsy's body and had to hold it at an awkward angle in order to view the data. Fubsy dug her claws into Nerf's leg, just a little bit, like a punishment for disturbing Fubsy's sleep. Nerf found that she didn't mind the claws as much anymore and shifted the compad to one hand so that she could pet Fubsy between the ears. Before dinner, Quirif and Alan approached the group. Quirif was evidently the spokesman and said, uh, We think we have our results. We're listening, so he said. We think portions of the station are repairable, but uh, it would take several days. Uh, we'll start with getting communications up first. Um, then the clients can decide if they want to move forward or scrap this expedition. Zoe rubbed her right arm but didn't seem to notice what she was doing. Well, if they scrap the mission, they scrap the mission. You'll still be paid, Zoe, Nara said. Not the bonus, but you'll still earn enough money. Alan looked curious, but Nate made some a signal to him and shook his head. No worries, Zoe said, in a voice so matter-of-fact that Nerev knew that she was upset. This is what I signed up on for. It's always a crapshoot with expeditions. Bubsy walked over to Zoe with a little bleating sound and Zoe laughed and picked her up. Bubsy grabbed Zoe's right thumb and started chewing in a determined fashion. Ow, you little rascal. I still feel pain, you know. Zoe adjusted the jewelry that connected her prosthetic arm and said, There, now you can chew away until Tariff gets you some real food. Right away, Tariff said and jumped up to start dinner. Tariff wasn't sure but it looked like maybe Fubsy was a little darker than she had been this morning. End of chapter. Part 21 Humans are known for their superstitions. The most famous superstition is with regards to black cats. Black cats are regarded as highly unlucky. To some humans, to other humans, black cats are regarded as lucky. As with all superstitions, this is obviously nonsense. However, humans cling to this mass of conflicting theories with no basis in fact. The list of superstitions include, but are not limited to, opening weather migration devices indoors, walking under portable elevation devices, even numbered leaves and oxalis tetraphyla, dropping grains of sodium chloride, and carrying the severed distorted portion of a leopard eye. These may be regarded as bad luck, or good luck, by any individual human. Though generally, opening with migration devices under portable elevation devices is universally considered as bad luck amongst humans. It'll be impossible to know in advance exactly what superstitions your humans will harbor. Just humor your humans' idiosyncrasies. If they are upset when a mirror breaks, don't explain that the mirror can be easily repaired or replaced. Just apologize and get a new mirror. Dilliac Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Garen Feeding of Humans, Away with Red Shirts, published by Glass and Steel, The Garen Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159.
After dinner, Zoe stood up. I think we need to have a discussion about our plan tomorrow. Corif and Alan are going to work on the communication systems. We should probably work on collecting a few samples for the team tomorrow as well. Just in case we have to call the expedition off and go back. We won't be empty-handed. I want to also spend a little time observing the quagmire again. I'll take a couple of force field nodes with me and just do some discreet observations. Because that thing is bugging me. But tonight, she paused and smiled. Tonight, I think we should try some of those uh, roasted marshmallows. Yes, Alan shouted, raising his fists into the air. Finally! They broke out the marshmallows, and Terraf had a long forks for roasting and a small fuel gel pack for fire. Nate seemed to prefer to set his on fire and then wave them about to put the fire out before eating it. Zoe liked to gently roast hers on all sides until it was even brown color. Alan set his on fire like Nate, but then he pulled away the burnt marshmallow layer off and ate that. And then he roasted the interior remains of his marshmallow gently, like Zoe did. He explained that he got the best of both worlds. Terif and Querif tried all the methods, but Nerif just stuck to copying Zoe. She wasn't all that comfortable waving a flaming ball of sugar around in the air. The roasted marshmallows tasted just as delicious as Alan had promised, and seemed to give an initial burst of energy that Nerif enjoyed. After a while... She and the rip settled down and they all sat and sang songs. Nerif was very sleepy and didn't notice when she drifted off. In the morning, she woke up to Terif making breakfast. I slept through my watch, Nerif asked, horrified. Terif grinned a little lopsided. Well, you did. Well, not the humans. They kept watch. They said a lot of sugar can do that to some folks. Zoe, you should have woken me up, Nerif said. But looking around, she didn't see Zoe. Where is Zoe? Nate grabbed some breakfast from Terif and stuck a forkful in his mouth. She left earlier, he said, around his food. Wanted to get an early start in observing the quagmire. No, oh, Nerif felt a little let down. She knew Zoe wanted to get in and out, and taking her along would have slowed Zoe down. But she felt like Zoe left before she woke up to avoid her. Okay, um, well, uh... I guess we all have plenty to do anyway. She pulled on some fresh clothes and scrubbed her face before pulling out a storm data again. Nerif, um, what the hell do you have on? Nate asked. Everyone else looked up in Nate's tone and Alan made a sound. Nerif looked down at her clothes. Uh, my clothes? She said. My red shirt? What in the hell were you thinking? Putting on a red shirt on an expedition? Nate said. He sounded almost angry. Nate had never been angry before. I'm s- sorry, uh, uh, Nerf said. I'll change. Nate sighed. I'm sorry, Nerf. I shouldn't have jumped on you like that. It's just a silly superstition. No, uh, it's okay, Nerf said. Uh, I, uh, I'll change. When she was done changing, Nate looked embarrassed. Any luck with those storm charts? He asked. Nerf shook her head. I've gone over them and over them, but... I don't see any patterns. Let me try, Nate said. Humans are really good at finding patterns, he said. Nerif handed over the data with a sigh of relief. Don't let Zoe hear you say that, she warned him with a smile. She stood up and looked around. She could collect some samples, nothing big and nothing too far away from the force field. She didn't want to have to drag Nate or Alan away from the jobs to bodyguard her. She took a walk around the perimeter of the ground station still inside the force field, trying to pick out what kind of samples she would collect. Bubsy followed her, until Nerif picked her up and took her to Tariff. Tariff, you're on Bubsy duty again. I'm worried that she might try and run out of the force field when I go through to get a sample. Tariff willingly took Bubsy in his arms. Bubsy girl, do you want a snack? Nerif went back out and circled again. This time she paused near when Nate's antelope had impacted the force field. There were a few glowworms on the ground. Evidently, they'd fallen off when the whatever was dragged the antelope away. Perfect, Nerif thought, and went to get a few collection kits. She came back with the kit and crouched down on the ground, examining the best way to collect one. She opened the plastic case, the bottom in one hand and the lid in the other, tried to gently scoop up the glowworm. 
It popped like a soap bubble, and Nerif rocked back on her heels, thinking. She pulled out a knife and dug underneath the ground around the glowworm, and then picked up the soil sample. The glowworm balanced on top. She slid the soil sample and worm into the collection box and labeled it with a date and time, and geomarker, as well as notes about the history that they had observed. She picked up the remaining two glowworms the same way, and was able to successfully collect them without damaging them. She headed back to the station, and Fubsy came running up to her, making little peeps at her. Nerev picked her up in one hand, samples in the other. How's it going? she asked Nate, while she loaded the samples into the case. A simple job made a little more difficult by Fubsy's interference and headbutting. Nate groaned and rubbed his eyes. I've been looking at this data for hours, and I can't see any patterns. It hasn't been hours, Nerev said. Hardly even one hour. Zoe's probably just gone to the site about now. Zoe's been there for hours, Nate said, surprised. Nerf looked at him. What do you mean? She left early this morning, Nate said. At Nerf's lack of comprehension, he clarified. Early this morning, when it was still dark. She took some false field notes with her and, um... Nate looked at Nerf's expression. Hey, don't look like that. She's fine. She sent an update about 40 minutes ago. Nerev set Bubsy down and held out her hand for the data. I'd feel better if you'd go and check on her, Nerev said. Give me the data and we'll stay here with Alan. You go act as a backup for Zoe. Bubsy climbed up Nerev's leg, making sad noises, and Nerev picked her up again. You are a pest, she told Bubsy. Nate stood up and stretched. Zoe told me to keep an eye on you. Here, she's a grown-up and a veteran, and she knows what she's doing. Nero thought back to the release file and opened her mouth to say something, as Zoe walked in through the door. Yes, I do know what I'm doing, Zoe agreed, and what I'm doing is calling an end to this expedition. Now, Alan and Querif, do you have the communications up and running yet? Alan shook his head. We've heard a little snag with the power supply. We can hook it up to the main battery, same as we do the lights, but in order to prevent burning out the circuits we put in, we need to trickle energy source first. The ground station is burnt out, so we can't get it up and running yet. Zoe's face looked grim. We need the station to landscape a landing area right here and send another shuttle. What's going on, Zoe? Nara asked. I spent all morning watching the quagmire, Zoe said. I think it uses spores for mind control to bring prey to the make base. It's not one big creature. It's millions of little ones. She looked at the confused faces around her and sighed. Back home, uh, we have these ants. They use spores, and these spores infect these ants and then make the ants leave the colony and climb up a tree and spread more spores. I saw this thing. It looks like a cross between a skunk and a hedgehog. It started eating Nate's antelope. It's not my freaking antelope, Nate said under his breath, though everyone could hear him. It popped some of those glowworm things, and then after a while... He just stopped eating and walked into the middle of the quagmire and stopped. And, um, didn't struggle when it got pulled down. And I think we should leave. Now. And not come back until we have better protection than this used for the two or three rated planet, Zoe said. But Zoe, Nareff said, I collected some glowworms today. One of them popped and I feel perfectly fine. Then everything started growing dark. And she could hear Zoe's voice, full of pain. So much pain it made her want to cry for Zoe. And what Zoe said was, Oh, Nerf. End of chapter. Part 22 The difficult we do immediately. The impossible takes a little longer. Human saying, Dubiuk, Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Quoting, Humans, published by Glass and Steel, The Care and Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. Nerev woke up, hearing Zoe's voice, hard and angry. Use the power cell, Alan. Just use it. Alan's voice was soft. Zoe, um, even if any of us had the technological know-how to open up your arm, there's no guarantee that we could get your power cell out in one piece much less make it work in a system that is not compatible with your arm. Nerf could feel a small tongue licking her face, and someone was washing her hands. 
She opened up her eyes. Hey, you, Tariff said quietly. Tariff was evidently the one washing her hands, and Fubsy, of course, was washing her face. I don't care, Zoe said. If there's a chance, do it. Nate saw Nareth watching them and nudged Zoe and tipped his head towards Nareth. Zoe walked over to Nareth and crouched down. Hey, uh, Nareth, um, how are you doing? I'm fine, really, Nareth said and tried to sit up. Whoa there, Zoe said, holding Nareth down with one hand against Nareth's chest. I don't think you should get up. Really, Zoe, I'm fine, I, I just fainted. Uh, that's all, Nareth said. We're uh, working on a way to get you back to the med center of the ship, Zoe said. I am fine, Nareth insisted. Nareth, um, you're not fine, Zoe said. We scanned you, and there is evidence of spores in your system. Just lie still, please. Zoe looked at Tara, who nodded in reply to whatever Zoe had said with that look, then got up and turned back to her argument with Alan. Zoe, Quareth interrupted before Zoe could start again. Alan's right. I've looked up the specs in your power cell. We can't make it work. Alan and I are not ground station engineer specialists. I'm a shuttle pilot and Alan's into electronics. We can't do it. We're just going to have to walk back to the shuttle. Three days, Zoe, Nate said quietly. He turned his back to Nareth, trying to hide his words from her. I don't think she can last three days. Nareth closed her eyes and felt Fubsy's tongue start the rasping wash again. Fubsy, Tariff said, his voice soft and sad. Fubsy, leave her alone. No, Tariff said, she is fine. She opened her eyes again. It won't be three days, Zoe said in a firm voice. We can do it in three hours. Three hours, Nate said, in disbelief clear in his voice. Yes, Zoe said, and fixed Nate with a terrible and powerful glare. You know why? Because we're the motherfucking humans. We are the badassest creatures in the galaxy, and we can run from here to the shuttle in under three hours. Nate nodded slowly and smiled. Okay, then. Let's do it. Zoe, Alan said quietly. The rifts would never be able to keep up. I know that. Zoe turned to glare at Alan now. We'll carry them. Carry them? Alan nodded slowly and smiled. Okay, then. Let's do it. You can't carry us, Nareth protested. Oh, yes, we can, Zoe said. And when she looked at Nareth, her gaze was cool and confident and something else. That was just a little terrifying. We have bones that are stronger than your building materials. We're from a planet that makes gravity here a joke. We are the scariest persistence predators that you will ever wish to avoid. And most of all, we do not give up. Zoe turned back to everyone else. Leave everything here. Dress in dark clothes. We leaving in five. Leave everything turned out to be impossible. Nate remembered the samples that Nareth had taken and without saying anything to Zoe, slipped them into his pockets. With a wink at Nareth. No one asked Zoe if everything included Fubsy, who refused to be detached from Nareth anyway. Zoe seemed to not notice. Shoot anything that gets in our way, Zoe ordered as they closed the door to the ground station. And move out. Zoe carried Nareth, of course. Nareth carried Fubsy. Alan carried Quirif. And Nate, of course, carried Tariff. They used something called a piggyback, which meant that the rifts sort of rode on the humans and sort of clung to their backs. To Nareth's surprise, the humans didn't start out at the fastest speed. She'd seen them work out in the gym and knew that they could run faster. But the speed didn't vary. They just kept moving, and I went on and on. Zoe's body grew wet with sweat, but she didn't slow down. Nate and Alan let Zoe set the pace and ran with her. Nareth noticed that they were running together, right foot, left foot. The combined impact of their feet made the sound that seemed to notify everything in the woods that there was a force to be reckoned with. A silence grew around them and Nareth could hear only the breathing of the humans and the rhythmic sound of their feet hitting the ground. Right foot, left foot. Fubsy was asleep, her claws sunk into Nareth's clothes. If she felt jostled in her sleep, she sunk her claws a bit deeper, but didn't wake. They broke through the trees and could see the shuttle ahead. Pick it up, Zoe said, and even though Nareth couldn't believe it after all this running, 
the human started running even faster. Arif, get that door open, Nate said, with pauses between his words. Querif pulled out his combat and opened the door of the shuttle. Light her up and switch on comms, Nate ordered. Done, Querif said. They loaded into the ship, Zoe, Alan, and Nate gasping for breath as they came to a stop in the shuttle. Belt in, Querif ordered. Let me talk to the ship, Zoe said. Go, said Querif, as he started to lift off. We have a medical emergency, Zoe said. What's the nature of your medical emergency, said the voice over the speakers. Nerif has been infected by spores. We need a level red biohazard isolation set up for Nerif, and all the rest of us too, until we can be decontaminated and declared clean. Zoe glanced at Fubsy. Nerif had stuffed Fubsy in a bag and had been designed for a first aid kit, the contents of which were now dumped on the floor. We also have a Xeno Carnival with us, Zoe added. Look at what followed us home. Can we keep her? Adam said in a rush, before the voice on the other end had a chance to say anything. There was a silence followed by a sigh. This is the captain. We were a little concerned when we didn't hear from you for several days, and our senses showed a large-scale storm activity. We have an isolation meta-chamber set up for you. Welcome back. The shuttle docked with the ship easily. Nate, who'd fallen asleep during the trip, woke up with a loud clunk sound of docking. They had to wait in the ship while the decontamination wash and UV light was played over the ship. They emerged directly into the isolation medichamber, which had been fastened to the shuttle door. Tiv and her crew were wearing isolation suits, and through the speaker installed in the hood, called Nerif over to the window, where a large-scale scanner was set up. I have the initial scans on the compads, Zoe said. You'll need the data. The medical team didn't respond to Zoe. She marched over to where they were standing and said, Data! We have some. You need it. Something about a tone of voice called Tibbs' attention. Please upload the data, Miss Zoe, Tibbs said. Then please stand back so that we can finish our current scan of the Linmead friend here. Zoe hastily stepped back and then uploaded the data from the compad. We also have samples of the spores, Nate offered. Zoe looked at him in surprise. Nate shrugged. I figured leave everything only meant leave everything not important. Tiv was eager to have the samples for testing. After scanning Nerif, everyone else had to be scanned one by one. Even Pubsy, who was now out of a first aid kit bag, had to be scanned. She had ripped her bag open so that they couldn't stuff her back in for the scan. In the end, they scanned her by putting her in a place of the scanner and then distracting her with a makeshift toy made of gauze from the first aid kit. Once the scans were done, Tiv ordered a full decontamination for everyone, even Bubsy. And, um, how exactly are we going to make that happen? Alan asked. I'll do it, Zoe said. She picked up Bubsy up in her right arm and headed to the decontamination. She stopped before entering and dialed her pain sensors down. Judging from the pitiful wails, Bubsy was not a fan of decontamination. Once the decontamination and dressed in new clothes while the old ones were being destroyed. I like that shirt, Nate muttered. Tiv came to the window and asked a full accounting of the spore behavior. Then she left. I actually do feel fine, Nerif said in a quiet and embarrassed voice. Let's keep it that way, Zoe said. End of chapter. Part 23 Humans suffer from more addictions than any other species in the aggregate. This is not a surprise when you consider how many chemicals they create in their own bodies that have addictive properties. These addictions play a large part in why humans are so willing to go on expeditions to death worlds and potential death worlds in the first place. The thrill, or the high they get from being in dangerous situations, is how they get their bodies to produce those addictive chemicals and hormones. This also means that when an expedition is over, humans are prone to withdrawal. They become cranky and irritable. Humans may, during this period, self-medicate with alcohol. If you notice this happening to your human, it is best to distract them with exercise. Diviuk Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Garen Feeding of Humans, Post-Expedition Blues, published by Glass and Steel, The Garen Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. Tiv returned a short time later with scan results in her hand. I've got good news and I've got bad news, 
Which do you want first? What the hell kind of question is that? Zoe demanded. You're a doctor. Doe looked confused. The book says that humans like this game. I thought it would help us with this tense moment. Zoe growled. Just forget the book. Tell us. Nerf, you're probably fine, Tib said. Probably. Um, uh, that's a word you like to hear from your doctor, Alan muttered. Tib ignored him and continued. The spores are, are in your system, but because your system is so alien to the spores, we don't expect they'll be able to do anything. Except for the spores and slightly elevated levels of analgesic neurochemicals. You seem fine. The neurochemicals are probably just relief from being back on board the ship, as it is present in all of you. Zoe hugged Nerif, who said, I um, told you I was fine. However, Tib said, you'll need to stay in isolation until the spores are processed out of your system. Everyone else, except for the aforementioned analgesic neurochemicals, your scans are fine and you can leave now. We also see no signs of spores in... Uh... Tov looked down at her notes. Fubsy, is it? She pronounced the unusual name slowly. But Fubsy should stay in quarantine as well. Well, we determine if the Xeno Carnivore is carrying anything untoward. That's adorable Xeno Carnivore to you, Tariff muttered under his breath and Nate laughed, which he turned into choking and coughing. Tev looked up from her notes. Excuse me? What if we want to stay? Alan asked. Tev looked confused. I, um, I don't understand. What if we want to stay with Nerif and keep her company? Alan persisted. Tev looked at Alan somewhat frostily. I don't need five non-patients taking up room and resources in my medi-chamber. Tev pulled the clipboard closer. It's time to leave. She pointed at the chamber that acted as an airlock between the medi-chamber and the rest of the ship. See ya, Nerif, Alan said, a little awkwardly. If you need anything, you just let us know, okay? Tariff walked up to her and ruffled her feathers with his hand. You get some rest. We'll come back and visit. Quirif asked Tiv, Are you going to install the rejuvenation pod in here for her? Tiv looked at Quirif. My staff are quite aware of the medical needs of your Nesta. She will have the appropriate care facilities until she is free of spores. Quirif gave Nerif a smile. The class accommodations for you. Nate walked up to Nerif. You take care of yourself, you hear? And you need anything, you don't hesitate to let us know, like um, Alad said, okay? Zoe came up to Nerif and hugged her close. I was so afraid that we were going to lose you, Nerif. She whispered in Nerif's ear. Don't uh, do that again. Nerif hugged her back and whispered, I won't, I promise. Nerif and Fubsy watched the team leave the medichamber. Each one glanced back and gave her a wave goodbye. Even after all this time with humans, Nerif was still excited to perform the hand-waving gesture, and did so enthusiastically with both hands. When they were gone, she turned to Bubsy. I guess it's just you and me now, she said. The kitten walked up to her, tail straight in the air, and placed her front paws as high as she could on Nerif's legs. Oops, Nerif said. Uh, Tiv, I think Bubsy is hungry. Will you ask Tariff to prepare some food for her? He knows what she likes. Tiv sniffed. My team is capable of handling the needs of a Xeno carnivore. Well, can someone get us food now? We haven't eaten for a few hours, and Fubsy can get quite demanding when she's hungry. Tiv tapped on a combat and then looked up to Nerif. Food will be here shortly. In Nerif's somewhat limited experience with medical facilities, when the medical team said shortly, that usually meant hours. She picked up the gauze toy that made for Fubsy and tried to distract her. It wasn't hours before the food appeared, but it felt like it. Nara fed Fubsy first and then started eating her own food. She made a face. It wasn't nearly as good as Tariff's food, but she was hungry enough that it didn't matter too much. Fubsy seemed to be of the same opinion. She turned up her nose at the food at first, but then gave up and ate when she realized that she didn't want anything that Nara was eating. There was literally nothing to do in the medichamber. So Nara started reviewing the storm data again, hoping to find some pattern, temperature, wind, humidity, anything. Around dinner time, Fubsy started wailing pitifully. A speaker clicked on, and Tib's voice came over the sound system. Nerif, what is the objectional sound? 
Are you or the Xeno Carnivore injured in some way? No, Nero said. I think Fubsy is hungry or lonely. She's used to having a selection of people for playing and distraction. She's looking a little paler too. Can we get her some food right away? The only answer was a click from the speaker. A food droid did appear shortly though. Nero set Fubsy's food out only to have Fubsy walk up to it, sniff it, and then turn around and scrape the floor like she was trying to cover the food with dirt. It can't be that bad, Erif murmured, and then took a bite of her own food. Classic medical facilities food, perfectly balanced nutrition, and not one bit of taste. Nara ate hers, but Fubsy refused. She lay on the floor and didn't look sick, exactly, though Nara wasn't sure if she'd know what it looked like if Fubsy were sick. However, she definitely didn't seem well, and Nerf was sure her fur was paler now, with dark stripes becoming more visible against the lighter colored fur. Tiv, Nerf called out, but there was no response. Nerf picked up a compad and sent a message to Ernesta. Bubsy doesn't like the medical facility food, and I agree that it is not up to your standards. Could you smuggle us in some food? The droid showed up a few minutes later, and as Snarif had opened it, she could smell the difference. Bubsy came running over to the droid, energy restored by the smell of Terra's food. When Nerif took the food out, Bubsy made a questioning noise and tried to climb into the droid. Terra's not in there, Nerif said, but he sent you dinner. Bubsy complained about the insult, but evidently wasn't too upset to eat. In with the plates of food was a note from Terif promising that the team would come and visit her during the visiting hours tomorrow. After eating, Fubsy's bohemia seemed normal, but her coloring was still light. Eventually, the lights in the medichamber dimmed to about 50%, which meant that it was now time to sleep. Nerif lay down with a sigh and Fubsy curled up next to her, a small ball of warm in the cool medichamber. Next morning, Fubsy was definitely lighter, and Nerif waited anxiously for visiting hours. Breakfast was delivered via two droids. The first one was medically approved food, and the second droid had Terra's delicious food. Once Terra's food was removed from the droid, it was filled back up with the rejected medical food, same as the night before. Food didn't seem to improve Fubsy's coloring. As soon as the door to the observation portion of the medichamber slid open, Fubsy ran to the wall to put a pause on the glass. Terif, Quirif, Zoe, Nate, and Alan walked in, though it seemed that perhaps Nate and Zoe had been having some words. It's so good to see you, Nate said. We've been bored out of our minds. Um, what's going on? Alan rolled his eyes. Nothing to worry about. Everyone is just crabby with no job to do or prepare for. Something's wrong with Fubsy too, Nareth said. What's the matter with Fubsy? Zoe asked. Maybe she needs more food. She doesn't seem hungry. But she's a growing girl, and her fur has been getting paler again, Nara said. Has it? Zoe looked at Fubsy through the glass and tapped to draw Fubsy's attention. She looks the same from here. Nara looked down at Fubsy, whose fur was back to the charcoal color that she'd been thinking of as normal. Not ten minutes ago, it was lighter, and you could see stripes. Fubsy rubbed her head against the glass where Zoe's fingers were, and sat down and washed herself. Whatever may have been going on, Fubsy was unconcerned. End of chapter. Spot 24 Humans often have a poor understanding of their own sayings and traditions. Take, for example, the saying, blood is thicker than water, which traditionally means that family is more important than non-family. However, the actual saying is, the blood of the covenant is thicker than water of the womb. This saying means that bonds forged with strangers in times of trials are stronger than the ties forged by an accident of birth, which is the exact opposite of the shorter version. As scholars, it's generally regarded as poor scholarship to write off the subject of one study. However, we have said it before and we'll say it again, with much evidence as our proof. Humans are weird. Dubiak Review of Ontological Species Studies, The Garen Feeding of Humans, Blood and Its Relative Thickness to Water, published by Glass and Steel, The Garen Feeding of Humans, Translation Engine 3.14159. Since Nerif and Fubsy were going to be in quarantine for 30 days, Nerif started collecting data on Fubsy. 
She took pictures and scans of Fubsy every hour during the day, as well as before and after meals and before and after visiting hours. Sometimes she took extra pictures to send to the team, when Fubsy was being extra cute. Sometimes the pictures led to videos, like the time Fubsy had grabbed one of the plates and was dragging it back to her sleeping area. She would stop and freeze every time the Nerev looked at her, and then start slowly backing up and then freeze again. It was adorable. Nerev was willing to consider that she was going a little stir-crazy, but the data gave her something to do and something objective to review. Nerev wasn't sure what the data meant, but she knew the data didn't lie. When Tiv finally gave them both the all clear, the ship had already been docked for three weeks. The team had hung around, visiting Nerev, and no one had taken new jobs yet. Nerev had gotten a sturdier carrying case fabricated for Fubsy. Since the captain didn't want to be associated with any Xeno carnivore attacks, that just bad for business, they were happy to fulfill the request. As Nerev disembarked, her luggage and Fubsy in a carrier, trailing behind her, she heard someone call her name. Nerev! Quirif and Terif came running up to her, laughing and crying. We're so glad you're out. Nerev saw Zoe, Nate and Alan standing by the transporter, with smiles that made the air feel warmer just by looking at them. Come on, come on, Terif said, grabbing her sleeve and pulling her towards the transport. Luggage was quickly stowed in the back. Bubsy was loaded up front where everyone was sitting, and the transport was directed to the hotel. We love the videos, Quirif said at the same time as Alan said, I loved watching Bubsy try to make off that plate. And Zoe said, It's so good to have you back with us. And Tara said, well, Have we got something to tell you? Nate said. And Nate said, We may have another job lined up. Wait, wait, Tara said. I can't really understand you when you're all talking at once. There's something important I need to talk to you about. Something I couldn't talk about while you were visiting me. Because I was afraid Tiv would overhear. And everyone was still. And then Zoe said, Don't talk about it here. The carrier has auto hearing. Let's wait until we get to the rooms. Once they were safely in Zoe's room, Zoe nodded to Nerif. It should be safe now. Bubsy was beside herself, climbing and licking and jumping from person to person. And it wasn't until she had personally greeted each person with both licks and headbutts at least twice before she settled on the bed and started washing herself. Nerf pulled out a compad and unlocked the secured file on a data in it. Once I had some idea where this was going, I decided to lock the data. It's a slideshow, basically. Here's a picture of Fubsy right before you come for a visit. A picture of a sandy-colored Fubsy with dark gray stripes appears. Here's a picture of Fubsy once you guys come in for visiting hours. A picture of a charcoal black Fubsy appeared. Alan said, Look at those beautiful green eyes. Yes. Nerev said impatiently. Bubsy has beautiful green eyes. Did you notice her fur? Oh yeah, Alan said. She's pale when we're not all there, and she gets dark when all of us show up, and the darker still when we're all there. Zoe smiled and looked at Nerev's face. We ran some tests of our own, Nerev said. I took so many pictures, I thought I was going to have to convince you that I'm not crazy. Nate took a deep breath. Actually... We're going to try and convince you that we're not crazy. Okay, Dara said as she sat down on the bed next to Fubsy. Show me your evidence and give me your conclusion. Well, um, Nate rubbed the top of his head, embarrassed. We were all squabbling with each other, a lot, and a couple times Zoe and I really got into it. It was bad, Alan confirmed. And not normal, Dara said. We've had the mission bitches before, but this felt different. Quarup stuck his thoughts in. At uh, the end of the mission, uh, if you don't like somebody, you just move on. If you do like somebody, you, you get their contact info and uh, move on. Maybe you'll work together again, and maybe you won't. Well, or maybe you'll suggest them for a team if there's an opening. Zoe took up the narrative. But we didn't split up. At first, we thought it was because of you. We were still visiting you every day. So maybe that's why we were still here. And then we noticed how much better we felt after we visited you. And then you remembered what Tib said about the elevated analgesic neurochemicals, Nero said slowly. In humans, those go by another, far more famous name. Zoe nodded. Endorphins. 
So uh, we started scanning ourselves before going in to see you. And after we were done with the visit, and we saw a slight lift in our analgesic neurochemicals. Even the rifts, added said. And Zoe was able to access one of your recent scans when Nate was distracting Tiv with some human nonsense. And she saw your rates were still elevated. And those elevation levels matched what they had been when you were first scanned and you fainted, Quirif said. So, uh, we think... Fubsy affects our analgesic neurochemicals, Nerif said. Only one way to know for sure, Nate said, and he scanned Zoe with his compad. It turned into a scanning party, because no one wanted to be left out, and everyone wanted scans on the compads. Nero scanned everyone, and saved the results to her secured files. Everyone's levels are much higher than they have been, Zoe confirmed. But uh, maybe you're all just happy to see me, Nero said with a smile. And we are, Data assured her. The real test will be tomorrow morning scans. Bubsy spent the night with Zoe, by virtue of the fact that they had been meeting in Zoe's room and Fubsy fell asleep and no one wanted to wake her. The next morning, Fubsy was still charcoal black. She was that color all night, Zoe confirmed. We must have been close enough to her that it didn't upset her whatever thing, Nerf said. They'd all done scans in the morning before rejoining Zoe and Fubsy. Nerus' levels had dropped overnight for the first time, but only a little. Zoe's levels had stayed consistent with the levels from last night. Everyone else had dropped a little, but not down to the previous lows. So, um, we are addicted to Fubsy, Nerif said. The next question is, uh, is she addicted to us? And after that, the question is, do we care? Well, that's part of where we convince you that we're not crazy, Alan said. When we figured out what might be happening, we talked about what we want to do. We hope you all agree with us, but we all want to stay as a team. Nerf felt a huge smile cross her face. All of us. One team. That would be amazing. It would mean uh, more Death World expeditions, Zoe warned. But then you could pay for a new arm, Nerf said. Well, actually, Zoe wrinkled her nose. I'm thinking I'm going to keep this one at least for a little while longer. It came in pretty handy when dealing with Bubsy a couple times, and um, she looked down at her arm. I don't really mind it as much anymore. It reminds me of one I've lost, but uh, it doesn't hurt as much. And I can remember some good things too. And, Quirf said, we would get to work with humans every day. I know, Nera shrieked, and then covered her mouth, laughing. If you're okay with it, Nate said, Zoe has a new job lined up for us. It's a Death World 3. Should be easy as pie. Nate, Tariff whispered loudly. A good pie isn't that easy to make. And the team laughed. And it was a good sound of people that belonged together. End of chapter. End of book. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed there are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one and I'll see you next time. Cheers.